Morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. It's 9.30 a.m. and today is Thursday, May 28th. My name is Brian Zumwalt. I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. On the panel with me is Don Crowell from the county attorney's office. He'll be serving as process moderator. Uh, before we start the meeting, do a quick roll call and ensure that we have adequate communications for each commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, can you hear me okay? Here. Good morning, everybody. Commissioner Seal. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Welch. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner Long. Good morning, I'm here in the courthouse, no less. <laughs> Commissioner Justice. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Commissioner Peters. I'm here. All right, Commissioner Gerard. Good morning. All right, Madam Chair, we have a quorum. I'll now turn the meeting over to you. Okay, great. Well, let's, uh, as usual, start this meeting with a moment of silence. Okay, thank you. Um, first item on the agenda. Well, first I wanna say, um, those of you who are waiting to speak about the issue on Bunce's Pass, we uh, talked about moving it up to the beginning so you could talk right away, but didn't wanna do that um, because it had already been advertised later in the agenda. But I would like to um, move it before the agenda briefing, if that's okay with the rest of the board. It's fine, because I think we'll have plenty of conversation. All right, uh, Mr. Administrator. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, the first item on the agenda is a local state of emergency. Today we're asking for a couple of actions. One is to extend the state of emergency from May 29th to June the 5th. That would uh, enable us to continue to receive federal funds, take any actions necessary as part of this pandemic. But the second action is a request that we move to the next phase. Obviously, we're under the state, um, the governor's administrative order uh, that has as part of his phased reopening of Florida. Almost all actions are a um, under the governor's order. There are three local actions that we request um, that we repeal at this time because one, we're as part of the governor's order but two, we're really in essence moving from a regulatory to a recommendation environment. The three items that we're asking that we repeal is first, that we have a restriction on the beaches and that requires social distancing. Well, that is, very, that is exactly the same as the governor's order in terms of social distancing and the group sizes. With the anticipation that one, we've tried to flatten the curve, we've tried to, put responsible practices in, we've had a significant law enforcement presence and the sheriff's office, the municipal police departments and others have done a fantastic job in terms of trying to educate uh, people through both signage, through the, the um, dashboard um, for the beaches and other means of getting people to separate, spread out and not have large crowds. We also recognize that that's unsustainable over time. And so we've, we've gotten past the Memorial Day weekend. Um, we believe it's time to uh, remove our restriction and simply go off of the governor's order and also continue to push the personal responsibility in terms of how we act kind of going forward into um, uh, what is likely to be a sustained period of time for increased risk. So that's the first action is that we ask we repeal the restriction that we have still maintaining the governor's order for beaches. As you know, last Friday, the governor um, modified his order to take away the restrictions on the size of classrooms in childcare facilities. That was never a county order, um, but there's a lot of confusion about that. But what we did have is we said at the uh, months ago that if you have a childcare facility, that your playground equipment should mirror the restrictions that the governor placed on class sizes. So it has at 10 or nine kids plus a teacher and that you have no group can um, you know, mix between the groups. We would ask that we repeal that and just simply allow the childcare facilities to operate as they are going to have to as a new normal. 
again, continuing to push the need for enhanced cleaning and sanitization um, and personal responsibility regarding cleaning hands and things like that. So those are one set of actions that we ask for your repeal. The second action that we ask for you to repeal is on beaches, I'm sorry, playground equipment, public playground equipment, and on pools. If you recall back our original order, we knew there was a risk with pools. Um, in fact, we had pictures of, um, you know, not just out on the beach of spring break, but on pool decks um, in certain facilities. But we have lots of different types of pools. We have pools at hotels. We have pools at large condo complexes. And we have pools at very small condo complexes. Uh, the health department put in guidelines regarding cleaning, making sure that people had proper ways in which to clean the handrails and things like that. So we put a 50% bathing capacity within the pools. Um, that really got the message out that we need to separate, we need to be responsible, and we need to enhance our, our cleaning um, practices uh, in order to stay safe. Um, we now think it's time though to take our restriction off, continue to uh, push the messaging and the guidelines of the CDC regarding continuing to clean both, you know, as a, as a pool owner, but also as to keep yourself safe when you go out and use pool equipment or use lawn chairs or other things. So we would ask that that repeal be, and along with what we had as a closure of public playgrounds, but both of those be effective Monday. Again, with summer coming, um, the playgrounds are used not only by um, you know families, but they're also used by many recreation programs um, um, and other types of uh, activities throughout the summer. We, we believe it's time to remove both the pool requirement and the public playground requirements effective Monday, uh, June 1st. The reason for June 1st is we had a, minute, a call with our municipalities yesterday. Um, the recommendation were on both the beaches, the pools, and the playgrounds. It was unanimous. Everybody was in agreement uh, with those recommendations, but they wanted time to be able to put up signage, uh, talking about personal responsibility, talking about making sure you clean um, and sanitize when you go out and you use equipment. Um, and so they wanted time to be able to put uh, that type of um, signage up. So again, those, those are the two recommendations. One is to extend the order from the 29th to the 5th, two, to remove the restriction on the beaches, effective and the child care facility playground equipment effective immediately, and effective June 1st, repeal of the 50% bathing capacity of pools and the closure of public playgrounds. Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Peters. Yeah, I, I got one question, Barry. Um, you know, I spent last weekend and the weekend before at hotels and just kind of checking out and see what they were doing. Um, and they're doing their very best to keep it clean, but because the hotels are at capacity, we had one hotel with 300 rooms, but wouldn't allow more than 14 people in the pool, on the deck, or anywhere within the pool area. And they're finding it very difficult to manage that. Could we lift it at least for hotels immediately? Um, they can communicate via um, restaurant and lodging and the, and the Chamber of Commerce can communicate really easily and quickly. Um, I really don't see why we have to wait till Monday. I understand the signage on the playground, we'll get that one. But on the pools, they can still keep them closed. They can still keep limited capacity. I don't know why we're keeping any deadline at all, um, particularly on pools because they can do whatever they want. All we're doing is giving them the freedom to do what they want, and there's no reason why we have to extend this to Monday. Um, I think for hotels in particular, if, if you're willing to bend at least on hotels to let them have the weekend so um, it's easier for them. Many hotels haven't been able to get up to staff, so they've had to put a lot of resources and putting staff at the pool areas and not in other areas of their business, and I think it would be very helpful to them if we could lift that immediately, at least for hotels. Um, could we amend that just for hotels to be immediately? Up to the commission, certainly. I, so I, I really would like to make that motion um, because the hotels are having a difficult time staffing up. They're using enormous amounts of resources to monitor that pool. And I honestly think that that would be a better way for them to use those resources. So I hope I can have a second on that motion. I'll second that. Okay, Commissioner Long, was that what you wanted? Yes. Okay, uh, Commissioner Welch. Madam Chair, and um, let me just switch my view so I can see everybody. Um, Barry, just wanna, and I know you wouldn't be making the recommendation if you didn't have 
uh, support, but I think it's important that we, you know, state for the record, um, particularly from Dr. Cho and Jameson, Thank you. Uh -huh. um, you know, what are the data trends that support making the move at this time? Um, in terms of all the things y'all talk about, the number of cases, the percent positive tests, the health system capacity, I think it's important to say why this is a reasonable move at this time and includes an acceptable amount of risk going forward. Uh, can y'all address that? Absolutely, Commissioner. It's a, it's a great point. Uh, as you, if you look at our dashboard, you see that we've enhanced testing significantly within Pinellas County. We're still finding um, way less than 2% of the percent of people tested coming positive. In fact, it's closer to one, one and a half percent. Um, in the last week, it was actually below 1%. And so um, we're, we're finding low uh, um, amounts of positivity, concentrations of high within our nursing homes and certain nursing homes, and we're addressing that, but that's really separate from community spread. Um, and on the playground equipment and uh, for particular and pools, we, and we talked and Dr. Cho is on the line, he certainly can speak for himself. We, we talked about what is a reasonable level of risk. Um, well, when you grab a shopping cart, you know, when you, you know, when you go out in public, we have to, we had to get over this curve and, and find out where this pandemic was going. But we also have to be, look at the numbers and accept what is, where is the right time to move to that new normal um, and saying, you need to be responsible. So if you are going to lounge in a, in a pool that you probably should sanitize that lounge chair before you sit down. Um, and kind of shifting from a regulatory approach, which is closing the pools, to a recommendation that we we highly encourage you to use masks, use the sanitation equipment, and make sure you keep yourself responsible. I think the numbers bear out that that's that that's uh, we're at that time, um, and we also have to recognize the impact these closures have on our population, and as we get into the summer months, but. Uh, if Dr. Cho would like to add anything, he's certainly welcome. Um, and I think, Barry, you, you touch on some of the key metrics that we're monitoring. Um, we look at those case counts and uh, have been, for the most part, relatively stable. The percent positivities has been low, less than 2%, as Barry mentioned. Uh, some of the other metrics uh, that we monitor is hospital capacity, and we did see some improvement compared to the previous week. Um, so in terms of availability, other things that I, I do monitor uh, includes the um, uh, with the syndrome syndromic surveillance. This is looking for these types of symptoms presenting to the emergency rooms, and uh, at least over the last seven days, both the influenza-like illness and the COVID-like illnesses have declined as well. So, uh, obviously, as we do move to a more reopening and, and, and different parts of the re reopening phases, uh, these are the same metrics we have to continue to monitor to see any upward tick or increases. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, just two more points, if I could. Yes. So, uh, Dr. Cho, I think you mentioned uh, at one point that kids aren't always the most uh, clean when they're out on playgrounds, and that's true. So how, how are we going to handle, you know, sanitizing those playgrounds in different jurisdictions? What recommendations are we giving? So um, regarding the playgrounds, and, and I'm, I'm actually speaking out of personal experience. I have three little kids, so <laughs> I, I, can, I can tell uh, but, but basically, I, I think it's reiterating the those strong, making strong recommendations, making sure that uh, we do that hand hygiene practices, encourage the parents to bring hand sanitizers uh, and disinfectant wipes, uh, making sure that, um, you, uh, that they help the clean, because obviously with the playgrounds, it's not somebody we can station out on a regular basis. Uh, and we need to make sure, maybe from our perspective, to make sure that the equipment's well ma maintained, that the paints aren't chipping, there's no tears, anything like that for other safety concerns. But really, I think in terms of any uh, of these uh, recommendations, is just making sure that we keep pushing the same message we do for any respiratory virus, the hand hygiene, um, wearing cloth masks when possible, especially more indoors, um, making sure that uh, we disinfect and, and sanitize when we can. Okay. And my final... Um point in question is, is on the beach issue and, um, you know, Sheriff and, and Barry, y'all have done a great job, especially compared to other counties. Um, so if we're relying on the governor's, you know, eliminating our order and just relying on the governor's social distancing and group size 
um, guidelines. I'm concerned when that goes away, when the governor makes a change, where are we, you know, documenting the county's position, our strong suggestion for masks and social distancing and all those things, where do those reside in county, county documentation or orders? Well, I think the um, issue of the social distancing is, um, uh, it goes back to what the messaging we've been putting out all along, whether you're at, you know, the store or whether you're on the beach is, you know, to spread out. You don't know um, who your, the next group is and mm -hmm. you need to, you need to try to keep yourself safe while enjoying, you know, the beach or, you know, outdoor activities or wherever you're at. Um, the, the, uh, but it's also a, an issue of, um, of enforceability. I mean, we had, we had 300, you know, law enforcement officers on 35 miles of beach. You know, there are some counties where there's one spot for a beach, uh, and it's a mile long or something like that. That's a little bit easier to manage, um, than when we have, you know, kind of a destination that we have, which is what we market and sell to the world. But, but it also, means that it's unbelievably resource intensive. Um, the municipal police departments and the sheriff's office that just did a yeoman's job of helping and managing that. Um, we may look and the sheriff yesterday um, talked to the municipalities about, okay, if we move to this next phase, we're gonna need to watch it. It doesn't mean that we don't come up with specific strategies. So for instance, um, you know, do Clearwater, do you have ambassadors? Do you want to do something with the ambassadors and work in conjunction with the sheriff's office. And he, he made that offer. If you come up with something that you think kind of putting that on the municipality, uh, especially where we have, we know we have um, uh, kind of hot spots of where people congregate in large numbers. If you want, if you want to work with us and do something different, well, let's talk about those. And, let, me, let me ask you, sir, because I probably didn't ask it in the right way. All, all I'm trying to get to is if we don't have an order, where is Pinellas County making that strong statement for masks? And, and I see Jewel raising her hand, social distancing, you know, where does that reside? Um, if you look in the resolution that you all have before you today, paragraphs two and three do still refer the public uh, to CDC guidelines. They make reference to those included in the, in the governor's order, but also in paragraph three, we do continue to, in, to maintain uh, a strong suggestion that people monitor CDC measures, including, um, and we have stated here, personal protective measures, um, encouraged to wear a face cloth covering while indoors in public. So we do sort of in keeping with that shift from uh, a regulatory uh, posture to more of a um, personal responsibility and, uh, you know, pay attention to CDC guidelines. We do still maintain that in the resolution that you have before you today. So the resolution does that going forward? Correct. Regardless of what the governor does. Correct. Okay. And it is, you know, it is worded as a strong suggestion, but it is still maintained in your order. Okay. And I would just say, Barry, I totally get the enforcement issue. Um, you weren't here when I, I headed up a fireworks ordinance, which sounded great, but enforcement was a totally different thing where you can drive across the bay to get Hillsborough and buy whatever you want. So I, I totally get that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Yes, uh, Sheriff Bob. Yeah, yes, uh, Commissioner Walsh, just a, in, I, I understand your question and where you're going and making sure that it's uh, in a writing that comes from the commission, but know that our intention as well, uh, all those big yellow signs that we have up uh, that communicate the message and the recommendation, uh, it's the plan to leave all of those in place. Uh, so, you know, we'd like to think, right, that everybody reads what the commission uh, does and the orders. Do, don't they? We'd like to think that, but pro probably the best thing is we keep those yellow signs up and we yeah. can message it on social media, et cetera. So I, I do think those yellow signs have been um, effective. Uh, they definitely something different. You know, people get, you know, kind of sign fatigue sometimes, but you can't get sign fatigue with those because they're, they're uh, and across Clearwater Beach. I talked to, I know Chief Slaughter about it and I think they're going to leave them up and we're going to leave them up in other places. So I think that's really important that we do that. And that's the plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sheriff Barry. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Sheriff. I, 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 that was going to be my question. I, I assume that there's nothing on the sign that uh, doesn't allow us to keep them up. 
uh, like referencing this that we're, this uh, ordinance that we're about to uh, get rid of. Um, so that was the first question. But also, what is your thought, Barry, about putting um, any kind of signage yep. about what we are doing um, at the playgrounds? Um, I just think it again. I think that yellow sign concept is is right. It does it does draw people's attention. So, any thoughts our, on the playgrounds? Our um, first, the, the signs are generic. We have over eleven hundred signs out on the beach. Um, so, if uh, obviously you know, we can't force people to read, but you can't miss them um, because they're everywhere. Um, now, the on the playgrounds, we do have. If you approve this today, we will put out. We're going to send recommendations to the cities. Uh, regarding their playgrounds um, and we will be putting up signage for our playgrounds um, but encouraging the cities to do the same and in fact yesterday on the municipal call we shared um, like Greg um, Mims down in Indian Rocks Beach shared a mock-up that they had made and we shared that out with the cities in terms of the messaging um, and uh, kind of you know when you when you enter be responsible um, but you're here at your own risk that there's other people on the playground so uh, our intent is to put up signage and encourage all the municipalities to do the same. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Do we have any public who would like to speak to this item? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on this agenda item, please hit star nine if you're coming in on the telephone or hit the raise hand button if you're in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, it does appear that we have one member of the public coming on the telephone that wishes to speak. Okay. If you could go ahead and uh, give us your first name, last name, uh, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Please go ahead. And this is whoever's coming in on the Galaxy S8. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Randy Matcher is calling or in on your Zoom meeting here. Can you give uh, us, one I'm, so, I'm sorry, sir. Can you give a spelling in your address as well, please? Oh, sure. Uh, Randy Matchers, M-A-T-S-C-H-E-R-Z. And uh, address is uh, 5110 South Manhattan, Tampa, 33611. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, going forward uh, with the signage being recommendations, what is uh, law enforcement's uh, intention regarding um, when they do see groups, uh, you know, 10 or more within proximity to each other, um, is there uh, some enforcement they're planning or are they just going to say to uh, the citizens, hey, just to spread out a bit? Sheriff, did you guys discuss that yesterday? We're going to do what we've done. I, I can tell you that, you know, having been out there and lived this uh, since May 4th when the beach is open personally, uh, been there all weekend and all weekends is that people are really doing a great job themselves. Uh, and, and this is one of the reasons why I support um, this proposal and, and encourage the commission to uh, move forward with it because uh, by and large, the absolute majority of people are doing the right thing. And it, if not, then they just need a slight uh, reminder. And there's people out there that can do that. I don't see it as an issue um, and really doesn't require enforcement. I mean, it, it, really people are, people want to be safe. They want to be healthy. And we really see people take it upon themselves uh, to, to do it. So we haven't enforced anything. Uh, nobody's been cited. Nobody's certainly been arrested. And all. And, and I also think that uh, we're on the verge under the governor's order of going to phase two. Uh, and phase two takes that number uh, from groups of 10 up to groups of 50. So, you know, that will be another, but, but people have acted appropriately. I'm confident they'll continue to do that. And if not, then we can always revisit things. So uh, I, I, this is, to me, this isn't an enforcement issue. This is you know, just people do the right thing and have been, I'm confident they'll continue to do that. All right, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, do you guys see any, uh, um, <clears throat> in the future, does anybody have a crystal ball knowing when this uh, entire thing might just go away and we don't have to have yellow signs anymore? Or do you feel this is a permanent fixture of our life now? No, we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> uh, no, but I think it's a new way of, of being. I think we're all going to have to be careful going forward. So if you hear somebody with a crystal ball, we'd love to hear it. <laughs> I think by the Florida State Fair, there might be some woman who's right. there. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, thank you, All sir. Right, thanks a lot. I appreciate it.
Do we have anybody else? Uh, Madam Speaker, at this time, there are no more members of the, the public that wish to be heard. Okay. Well, we have a motion from Commissioner Peters, second from Commissioner Long. Any other comments? Not, uh, yes, Commissioner Welch. Madam Chair, after the vote, I, I did want to bring up one topic while the sheriff is still here, if you can. Okay. Comment. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll, Commissioner Eggers. Yes. Okay, so we're, we're letting the, uh, the, the pools at the <clears throat> hotels only <coughs> open this. Uh, uh, we're changing the ordinance to, uh, to allow them this weekend access, complete access. Is that the idea? Thank or you for bringing pools. that up. I forgot. Go ahead. For all pools. But everything else will be Monday? So my motion was hotels. Right. Um, Commissioner, um, I, I think condominiums could, you know, I, I, I don't want to go in on the condominiums. If they want to take more time, that's fine. Um, but my particular issue was the hotels because they haven't been able to staff up and they don't have the resources. So I, I, I get it. Yeah. So that's what the hotels. So that is the motion and we have a second, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Actually, it's kind of a scary notion that the hotels want to do it because they don't have the staff to implement the procedures, but okay. Um, yes, Commissioner Welch. So this is the extension of the local emergency and the resolution, both under the motion? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I think we're just looking at lifting the restrictions and I would suggest we do that way so that with the clerk is able to record the, uh, the okay. vote appropriately. Okay, this is just lifting the restrictions with the caveat that the hotels will be able to open their pools today or tomorrow, whenever. Um, okay, all in favor of that, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? All right, motion carries unanimously. So now we need to extend the state of emergency. So moved. I would make that a motion. Second. Okay, we have... Um, a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Peters. Any comments? Not all in favor say aye. Aye. Raise your hands. Do something. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? All right. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I know this is not regular order, but it's a, a timing issue. Um, the sheriff has mentioned a couple of times the evictions issue, uh, and I happen to be on a uh, town hall call with Governor or Congressman Christ and a few other folks uh, earlier this week, and Senator Rusan brought up the issue as well and talked about uh, a May 23rd, I believe, Tampa Bay Times article that talked about the governor's order expiring on January 2nd, I believe, sheriff, and there are like 190 evictions queued up there mm. and sheriff as you explain it you know we you have a different interpretation than hillsborough which has this administrative order and it seems like the only way uh, as you discussed to address this is if the governor extends his order um is that a correct understanding sheriff yeah so the uh governor's order uh, on the moratorium on filing uh, eviction actions uh, expires on June 2nd, which is Tuesday. If the governor does not extend that, then it lifts and goes back to business as usual on evictions. Uh, one of the things that people should know is probably the most important aspect and component of the eviction process that has the effect that concerns people is not the court filing itself, uh, but what comes on the back side of the process, and that's called a writ of possession. The writ of possession is when somebody is actually removed or thrown out and, as we call it, a kick out uh, from the property. And that happens on the back side. Um, I don't have any control and no sheriff has any control over that because when that writ of possession is issued by a judge, it commands the sheriff to affect it. Because you have competing interests there. You have the person who is occupying the property and then you have the property owner and your property rights. And so the judge issues the writ of possession to evict the person. We don't have a choice but to serve it. 
where the choice lies, the decision lies, the discretion lies, is with the court and with the judge. And as we went through this process early on uh, in the COVID response, is we had some judges in Pinellas County that stayed the rest of possession, and some judges did not. Uh, and I would suggest that it's philosophical and uh, where they believe the law requires and what equity requires and what the right decision is uh, balancing property uh, owner's rights and the person that's being removed from the property. And I know from some discussions with the chief judge here, he believes that, at least he's conveyed to me previously, I don't speak for him, but what he's conveyed to me is, is that he was not going to enter a blanket order on this because he believes that he didn't have the authority to do that. And that has to be done on an individual basis, judge by judge. And they, ha they do have the authority to stay if they choose to do that. But once it's issued, Commissioner, I have no discretion. And anybody that suggests that a sheriff has the discretion uh, when a writ of possession has been issued, I it's just wrong. It's just erroneous. And remember also, I think it's important for people to know, is the moratorium has to do with the filings and the requirement that the clerk forthwith, as the statute says, which means immediately, of course, uh, transmit uh, these documents over to the sheriff. So it suspends certain things, but it only has to do when the basis of the uh, eviction is people failing to pay. And there's other basis for evictions as well. So it, it's not as simple as there's just this blanket moratorium. There's a lot of moving pieces to it, a lot of components to it. But again, the most important thing, and I, you know, I don't, I just don't have any discretion over it. So if the judge, if the, uh, if, the if the governor lifts and the clerk and the clerk here in Pinellas County transmits these writs of possession to me, then we're obligated to serve. And Hillsborough did, though, did they issue um, their chief judge a blanket order in terms of description versus yeah. orders over here? I, I'm just not sure to tell you the truth. I, I just don't know the answer to that. I, I you know, I've heard something I'll, to that effect. So I just don't know. OK. Um, and so there's a timing between, say, the 190 that are scheduled for June 2nd or lined up. You're saying there'll be a lag before the writ is issued. It won't be. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I, yes. Because there's a process and, and you have to go through, of course, you have to file uh, the action with the court. You file the petition that goes through a process. The judge has to have certain hearings and certain procedures have to be followed. And so it isn't just a meeting. So if they're, let's say, ready to go and you've got these that are staged and ready to be filed, you're really looking at months uh, before a writ of possession would be issued. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, I suggest, is, is that some of the writs of possession that are sitting there that haven't been transmitted to us that are ready to be transmitted, and if the clerk transmits them, if the moratorium uh, is lifted, um, are, for a variety of reasons, right. most likely unrelated to COVID because the, the actions were filed and the causes of actions were filed before COVID even began because of the time it takes to get it through the process. So of course, it doesn't mean these aren't people that are affected by COVID, but the reason why the actions were originally filed is not because of people losing jobs, et cetera, because of COVID, because these have been in the pipeline for well, probably a long time, a period of time, probably six months or more. So well, that, that answers my question. That's a good point. I think it goes back to, we do have capacity through our CARES program that Barry and his staff put together to help folks that are behind right. rent and mortgage. And I guess if we can just hammer that these last few days for folks to utilize that. Um, but that answers a lot of my questions. I appreciate it, Sheriff. Thank you, sure, Madam no Chair. Yes, Commissioner Long. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I was just thinking as I was listening to the Sheriff and to Commissioner Welch, whether or not it might be, there might I mean, could there be any value in us sending a message to the governor asking him to seriously consider addressing this issue uh, promptly? I'm just asking. Madam Chair? Yes, that, Mr. Walsh. That's where I was headed. I was going to ask if the board was open to that, but after the sheriff has explained the gap between, you know, the filing and when the writ is issued. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to be timely. I'm not sure the folks that are affected by COVID don't have a better solution by 
accessing our CARES program. Um, yes, Commissioner Seal. Well, then that comes to bear, which is I was going to mention later, but our CARES program for both yeah. individuals as well as businesses is um, expiring June 1st. So right. are we um, intending to have this go longer? I think I've been really surprised by the number of individuals who have not applied for this relief, especially for rent and mortgage and so I on. Agree. That really concerns me. So I think we should think about extending that program uh, since June 1st is next week. Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Thank you. Um, Barry, what, what's your feeling about that? Um, the, the program on the individual assistance side has not been utilized as much as we thought it may be, right? Um, we're doing an all out uh, push, uh, contacting every um, group um, and organization to help get the word out for people to apply um, if they've been impacted by COVID. If you lost your job, um, then you've been impacted. And so we've, uh, we've really tried to get the word out on that. Um, if you wish to extend it, you certainly can. Um, and we would just simply, you know, put, put that and continue to market the program. The, the only caveat to that is obviously the other program you asked us to do is to create a phase two. Um, and the phase two, we can continue with um, bringing the program elements for a phase two, and we can bring that back to you. We just wouldn't be able to launch that program until obviously after we know uh, the money that is remaining. But we could do that simultaneously. If you wanted to extend it, for a couple of weeks, there's really no issue that I see. I'm um, kind of looking over to my staff as we're talking to make sure they they don't say no. Uh, um, but but that we certainly we certainly can do that and um, and uh, continue to market that program out because it, it is available. If you've been impacted and lost your job due due to COVID, you're eligible, and we can help you with rent, with utilities, um, and other things that uh, help uh, kind of stabilize you until you have uh, either return to work, have unemployment or other things. It's a, it's a small bridge, but it's a very helpful uh, tool to, to help you through this uh, time. So we'd be happy to extend it if you want to do that. Well, I would definitely like to do that but rather than do nothing. It doesn't look like we're spending that much money yet. We're not. Um, so, and I, I find it really hard to believe that there aren't people out there that need this assistance. I think an important thing to do would be to push it out to uh, the other human service agencies, because they're just coming back online, some of them. Um, and, you know, I know that there were several that didn't even have anybody in the office. Um, so I think as they're starting to see clients again, that they could be helpful in getting the word out too. Commissioner Seal, did you have? Um, right now, we're at 200% of federal poverty level. I didn't know whether we would consider um, upping that to 300%. And the one thing I, I want to um, Duke Energy this week, and they were referencing that um, down in St. Petersburg, that there has been a decline in applications over a typical period of time. And so I'm wondering because of almost like the stay on evictions and the, the utility companies, including Pinellas County and the city, saying that you don't have to make a utility payment, I think all of a sudden we may end up with people going, whoa, now I really need the money. So I would make a motion to extend the individual care program till June 15th and level 100% if we're allowed to do by law. Second. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. Anything else? Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Well, uh, again, I, I appreciate the, the comments from Commissioner Seal, but Barry, I thought that was the very thing that the task force was looking at. Uh, recommendations to extend the first phase, expanding the first phase to include more on the residential side there are, and also on the business side. So I, maybe I misunderstood that, but that's what I thought the task force was working on, exactly what we're talking about this morning. Well, we're doing outreach right now to all the different community groups and our organizations, chambers, everybody else, both on the business side and on the community side, 
to determine what a phase two would look like. Phase two could be in, increasing the amount of the individuals that we already gave assistance to and then expanding that to include other types of organizations. The key on that is obviously the documentation necessary. Um, we were trying to get something out quickly. Um, and, you know, the one to your point, Commissioner Seal, I, I do believe it's been very hard in terms of messaging. But, you know, we, we say it's 200 percent of poverty level. If you lost your job, you have no income. You're eligible. And, and uh, people look and they go, well, wait a minute, my 2018 tax returns say, well, OK, but <laughs> they, if you lost your job, you have no income. You're eligible. And so that there, there's been, you know, some messaging issues we've been trying to get out. But, but that is confusing. And I know um, that that may have prevented people from completing the application or going through that process. Um, but we can we've been trying to work on the messaging and trying to get that word out. Um, you know, we can certainly follow up. But your point, Commissioner. Eggers, we're, we're trying to fit, look at what phase two would look like right now. And we're trying to get all those different ideas and then bring back a series of recommendations to you in terms of where we think we can go with the next phase of that program. Well, and frankly, well, I though, I don't see us ending phase one, but including that with the phase two, you know, as we have done with loosening things up, those people in phase one are still going to need assistance, it, especially if they haven't gotten anything from us yet. So I don't know why we would move on to a whole different population and exclude the ones that were that are most at need. So can we just we can well we're trying to get the recommendation. By the time we get the recommendations to you, we that we, we would probably be at the June fifteenth. Um and, and 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 that's part of part of it on the phase two. We one of the things we saw is the amount of time it takes to to document and process, even in this phase one, and it was pretty simple. Um, we're actually doing far better than the other programs here in Florida in terms of turnaround and being able to process um, you know, applications and things like that. Um, but at the same time, we have to have documentation. We have to have an audit trail. When we get into other pieces in the phase two, that's the reason we tried to put that out in the phase two, it becomes more complicated. Now I've got to establish that you are actually a business. Now I have to establish because you didn't have a brick and mortar. There are other types of audit procedures that will be included within within those types of reviews. And so that's the reason we tried to make, break it up between phase one and phase two. But we can include an extension of phase one depending upon the funding availability so that we could, we could even uh, look at um, maybe as part of phase two, including the individuals that received assistance under phase one, they're also eligible for an additional month. Any of those types of uh, structures are possible. We're trying to look at that. Part of the obviously being was we didn't know how many people would take advantage of the individual assistance. So we didn't know how much of the money would be available at the conclusion of the program. Now we're seeing, and I think it's safe to say that it's gonna be, we're still gonna have a significant amount of money left over uh, to be able to continue to help people. Yes. Yeah, yes and again, I just want clarification here, Barry. There was $170 million sent to us for this program, or for what we think is related to these two programs. We started phase one with, I think you said $70 million, $35 million for each of the programs, 211 program and the business program. The, the 211 program maybe just hit a million, a million dollars. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm clear on yeah. numbers. So, so we have 34 million of that still left. And then on the business side, I know that I heard something the other day that just like, you know, I understand all the, um, all the checking that we have to do, but you're talking about the end of June to determine about the applications that were done in May. Um, I think that's a problem, but we've got money there too. And there are other businesses that have stepped up and asked for help and they need the help. And we're talking about, like, I, I'm just, this is extremely frustrating. I don't want us to ever look at any other government agency and complain about how slow they are because, and I know we have to do it. I know we have to do it with all the regulations in place. But the idea behind this was to make money available readily and quickly. And obviously, we're, it, it's not because well, people aren't applying for it. I mean, I just... And Barry, we said that we didn't think 35 million was going to be enough, uh -huh. okay? And we've got 1 million. So I, I, I think we need to extend it, as they've said, but we need to expand it as well because there are a lot of people are hurting. That $4,000 cash liquidity thing, 
really hurts people too, because they're always encouraged, well, let's keep one month of savings in place so that we can at least cover a month. Well, that knocks them out of this program. If they have more than $4,000 and they've lost their job. You know, these are things that we've got to loosen up on and try to try to make these things available. And there's still business owners that have started in November and December that have been decimated by this thing and they don't qualify. So, I, I mean, I, anyway, it's extremely frustrating. And, and I thought that was the whole point. We were starting back in the middle of May to talk about phase two so that we could start it in June, June one, continue phase one, but also expanding it. And so anyway, just. Thank you for letting me vent a little bit. Well, and and what we've also seen is, okay, that we have to have the documentation, right? And we have people start the application. I can't force people to provide the documentation necessary to be able to cut a check. And so we do reach out to them. We encourage them. We literally physically call them. And so, you know, I don't know what else we can do to complete that process. We're trying to do everything we can to walk people through and get them the assistance that I know and I agree with you that they need. Um, on the individual side, we have 900,000 people in this county. I didn't, there was no way to know how many people would apply to that. So, you know, whether it was 35 million or, you know, 100 million, we had no way of understanding that. We, we agreed at the time, and that was just three weeks ago, that we were going to build on this program. So we're bringing back to you recommendations regarding a phase two. We knew we would have uh, additional money. And so we're trying to reach out so um, to uh, different community organizations, and that would be city governments, um, you know, and others too that have all said, "Hey, we need help as part of responding to the COVID impact." And so all of those ideas are being collected. We're looking what a phase two could be. It could be a loosening of restrictions that we have. It could be any um, of the things that we've heard that you've heard out of the community, and we're trying to put all those on the table. When we bring you recommendations, you can structure it however you wish. Have you guys thought about any um, reaching out to any of those four areas, whether it's uh, um, uh, landlords, uh, utility companies, and spec and 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 the spec, um, excuse me, the uh, spectrum type companies, uh, internet companies, and and ways to try to uh, to uh, to uh, address some of these shortfalls because we know they're out there and we know people are are hurting, whether it's on you know, getting air conditioning for the summer or whether it's paying rent. And I understand that we got to document, but, you know, the way at this rate, we'll be sending $140 million back when we have a desperate need here. And so I just want to make sure that we keep pushing hard on that. I thought we'd be ready by now to look at that expansion of, of our program. So um, anyway. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, the two, two parts. One is, what is the timetable for those recommendations coming back to us? But as you're, you're going through those, um, the, the things I heard mostly were from folks who had businesses that operated out of their home that were impacted, whether they provided services or product or whatever to, to other businesses. And then the other thing was nonprofits. Um, I spoke with a nonprofit yesterday uh, and they're coming back, but now they're talking about spending a lot of, having to spend a lot of money for, disinfecting equipment or cleaning crews. Um, he was talking about a, a $15,000 fogger for disinfecting, all those kind of things that yeah. they had nowhere idea that they would have that in, in their budget needs. So those are the kind of things that we should be thinking about. Um, I know some of the cities are talking about nonprofit grants, but anyway, as we're going through that, but go back to the basic question of when are we going to see those recommendations from your, uh, your group? We're collecting them right now, be a couple of weeks. Um, and, and we'll be back to you. The um, and, you know, and to, to Commissioner's point before, um, you know, we could lift the cap. OK, we could make uh, higher grants available as part of phase two. We actually reached out to Duke. Duke text all their clients that have overdue bills um, and, and said that this program is available. So it's not for a lack of outreach. Um, and we have used the utility companies and others to try to expand that and make sure people are aware of the program. Um, but obviously it's not hitting because other, we, we believe there's more people that are eligible that aren't taking advantage of that. So we'll continue that, but we'll also look at that phase two. But we, we are collecting that information. It, it does take time. We're trying to reach out to the different organizations to where we can bring back recommendations for a phase two. Well, and I, have, <clears throat> I agree with Commissioner Eggers. I'm pretty frustrated too. Um, we had this, 
exact same conversation a week ago uh -huh. <laughs> and we're not much farther along. Um, and I guess I would really like us to look at the requirements that this that comes with this money and pair our regulations down to the absolute necessity and not just what we think is good documentation, but what the federal government might mm -hmm. eventually come and ask us for. In fact, as you were talking, I was wondering if uh, Duke would, would provide us the documentation for people that are behind on their bills and, and ready to, I mean, if- <laughs> They won't, we, we ask, they won't. Um, and but we're trying every way to work with the utilities to get that word out to, to assist folks in need. But they would reach out to their clients and tell them about the, the program available. Well, and again, I think we talked about this two weeks ago. I think the issue or one of the big issues is that people think that their it's their income from last year that matters. And if, if there's a way to really push that message out better, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 Clerk uh, Ken Burke just stepped into the, my office and wanted to w wondered if he could be recognized. Oh, I don't know if we rec well. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, he, he's here in the room, so he'll go ahead and speak. Ken. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Eggers. Um, I just wanted to give you all a um, a, a mon monitoring report on the business applications as far as the CARES money because we we have really. Every day we, we get reports that we generate from the clerk's office at looking at, at the status of these applications. And so far, we, um, as of yesterday, we had 5,320 applications. Um, some of them, 1,183, are in the system as being processed, but the person didn't complete it. Now, they could have started the application process and have figured they don't qualify. They don't meet the qualifications. So they've started, but it's an unfinished application. So it can't be acted on by economic development to, to process because the person has not finished their application. We have, um, after that, we, there's around 3,000 applications which are in some type of process. Um, uh, they've been returned for corrections. Additional information is needed. <laughs> Um, we ran into a problem with people, especially sole practitioners, using the wrong tax ID number, which is extremely important, and there can be no exemption from that because that's strict IRS reporting. They were putting their, the, the, the number that they use for their uh, paying their payroll taxes for their Social Security, which is the proper number, because they have to be receive a 1099 form at the end of the year. Um, so there's different processes that take place on this, and we track the number of days. Now, um, once an application is completed, it's sent over to the clerk's office. And so far, we have uh, received 780 um, uh, authorizations to pay, okay, for us to pay. Um, and then our, we have paid out by, um, within five days. And when I say five days, that's not business days. That means if we get an approved application on Friday and we pay it out on Tuesday, that's four days. That's five days, okay? We, we're paying out um, within five days, again, calendar days, 95% of the time. Um, and the ones that are not within that five days, it's generally because there is additional data that we need on the application. We Then in the next four days, we get that data. So within 10 days, we're up to 99% paid from the time it comes to the clerk's office. Um, and then the last one is the the ones, and I've asked for explanation on each outlier above 10 days, it's generally the person has not gotten back the information that we requested. Um, it, it, it usually relates to that, that, that tax matter of the proper number, uh, which is illegal for us to disperse the money without the, the, the proper um, tax number. Uh, so I just wanted to put some context as far as the, the, the length of time. Now, the length of time we're also measuring from the time the application is submitted to the time it, it, it comes to us. Um, and that's approximately an eight to 10 day period, okay? Um, averages out. So if you add the eight days to the, within five days, it is within two weeks from the time that they're finishing the application to the time the check is going out to them. Um, 
I'm not sure what can be done to reduce that time um, in between. Um, and it is, there, there are a lot of requirements, but I just want to put context into, there's, it is not a 30 day thing. It is, it is not, if, if people are waiting beyond that, I think then there's a problem with the application where it's not complete. Um, and they, or the whole idea is needed. And the, the other whole thing idea I just was want to touch on evictions, and this may not sound like a big deal, um, but once the uh, moratorium's lifted on evictions next week and they start getting processed, um, in order to stop an eviction, a person really needs to, the tenant really needs to put the money into the court registry. And we had a rule on that 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 had to be certified funds. Um, we have relaxed that rule as far as it relates to 211. If 211 sends us the money, to put into the court registry, they will have fulfilled the requirement and we're accepting that money. In the past, we wouldn't have. It's a nuance, it's, a, it's an interpretation question on the, on the and a, a, a common policy throughout every clerk's office that only receives certified funds, but we relax that for the eviction process to help people out. I just wanna point that out. Thanks, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, thanks, hey. Madam Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? So the motion that we have right now, extend the phase one for two weeks. I'm not sure I, I see the point of it expiring in two weeks even, but I mean, if we're gonna have new recommendations in two weeks, I think those are things that we can add to what we have right now, given what we, haven't been able to hand out yet. So I'm, I'm not sure why we have um, a week time limit on that. I think, um, Commissioner Seal, you made that motion. Well, I'm willing to extend both programs, both CARES programs for the individual and business. Why don't we extend it through June 30th for the time being. And then hopefully around June 15th, we'll have the task force recommendations and we can expand it. All right, that's what I'll change the approach to do that. And oh. to, depending on how you all feel, we just stay at the 200% of federal poverty level. So basically keep the programs the same so there's no confusion. And then um, hopefully around June 15th, we're able to expand it based on the task force recommendations. Okay, thank you. That okay? Uh, Commissioner Long, are you okay with that? <laughs> was that a yes? Just shake your head. <laughs> Brian's got me muted. It was, I couldn't get, yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so we, we have an extension of both programs through the end of June. Uh, there are no further comments. All in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Peters, are you opposed? Oh, okay. Um, motion carries unanimously. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. To loop back to the evictions that started this conversation, um, I did um, text uh, Senator Rusan before our meeting and asked him about the the concept of a letter to the governor extending, asking him to extend the order. Is that something the commission and the commissioner long uh, brought that up? Is that something the commission has enough information on to be able to, to support today? I know it's not regular order. Um, I can join the Senator in, a, in an individual letter, but is the commission have enough info to support asking the governor cons to consider uh, extending the moratorium through the end of June? I would, I would ask, I would be interested in asking, I mean, we can only ask. Right. There's no harm in asking, is there? Well, I think the basis for the original moratorium, you know, the problems with the unemployment system, the reimbursements, it's a lot of things in COVID on top of that. I just think um, it's reasonable to ask them to, to look at extending that. Uh, yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I understand the the ask and the request, uh, Commissioner Welch. Um, I'm just trying to understand the disconnect between this list of folks that 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 were on the eviction list before COVID. I'm sure there's another list. I'm sure of people um, 
that are behind in their rent payments since COVID started. Yeah. And yet, and so, so we asked for that extension, the pipeline gets longer and people aren't applying for these funds to help offset those monies. I, 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 I'm just, so we asked for the extension, the landlords get further behind on their abilities to pay their mortgage. And if it would, if it would help so that our folks would get in there and get this money that we have available to pay some of those landlords so that they don't have to lose their own apartment complex or whatever. I, I get it. I'm just, I'm, I, I'm just struggling with this. And I, you know, I certainly understand the question. I have no problem, you know, making the request, but at the end of that 30 days, if people aren't, well, anyway, I said it. So um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is here. Yeah. You know, so I respond quickly, Madam Chair, uh, just another bit of information. I, I think I forwarded this to Barry. Um, received a, uh, an email from the Clearwater CDC, I think uh, is the name of the group, who were concerned that we've got the program, but people that are going through foreclosure or eviction need additional help. And they've uh, offered to help out with that process. I'm going to send that to Barry just so he has it. But I think also some of the things that Barry's going to look at, like the $4,000 in savings, I think that probably excluded a lot of people, as you said. I think there are ways we can tweak it and there's no silver bullet. I just think you got this big date coming up on June 2nd. We don't have a real clear answer as to what we're doing to, to try to address that evictions situation. So I get it. it, it you know, this was not regular order and um, y'all don't, probably don't even have the article from the times, but you know, I plan to join the Senator in this letter. I can do, do it individually. I get that. I just, you know, be more powerful coming from the commission, but I, I totally get your, your concerns on that commissioner. Eggers. Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I, think, I was just going to say again, just final, the final comment is that um, I, I'm looking forward uh, to our, our phase two recommendations because, you know, if we're waiting a, a couple of weeks on those, again, we're getting well into another month of rent from people. Um, and so, um, this, obviously, the sooner we can get that, the better. Um, I do, you know, as this thing prolong goes further out, and, you know, it starts to go into the second and third and fourth month. I do start to get concerned a little bit about the downstream effect. And I mentioned that a minute ago about, you know, folks not being able to pay their mortgages on the buildings that these folks are renting from. So we just have to be mindful of that as we as we again I, I agree with you if we get another 30 days and see what we can do in that 30 days and maybe exponentially with all these different uh things that we've come up with really ramp up and really help out people i mean i'm assuming that there's lots of people out there that desperately need this help you know and and, and we're just we're not making the connection somehow and I, i've heard all the reasons today or some of the reasons so um i'll support that but again, I just think we need to be mindful of that next that next ripple effect downstream. So thank you. Well, I would agree. That was my sort of concern with asking for the extension that, you know, the landlords are also hurting. Um, and I hate to even <laughs> ask this, but when we talk about the business assistance, Maybe that's one of the things we also talk about is the money that people like that have lost. If that's their income, having a property and renting it out, and they've lost all that income, is there any way that we can help them? I know that just complicates things, but yeah. Sheriff, I think you had something. Yeah, yeah, one of the things I just, because of Commissioner Eggers' uh, concern, I, just, I think it's something that maybe help uh, of an understanding too, because you're you're drawing, uh, I think, a, a complete nexus or a strong nexus between uh, the evictions and people not availing themselves of the available funding, et cetera. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is, is that not all evictions are because of failing to pay. There's a whole host of other reasons why landlords are evicting people. Some people are just bad tenants. There's other reasons that come into play with this. I don't have numbers for you, but I know that they're not all financially driven. So the reason for the eviction and the eviction process 
the money may not fix the issue is what I'm saying. So you, it's something to keep in mind because it may help with some of the frustration is that, you know, we've got this pot of money, we're here to help you and you're not availing yourself of it. So you're in this process, but they're in the process for a different reason. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I'm sure that's true for a lot of them. I mean, I have concern though, as, as commissioner Welch was talking that the people that, started not being able to pay their rent in February or March, March or April, yeah. are now going to start in the process of getting evicted. And those are the ones we really want to help if it's because they lost their income. But yes, so I, do we need to vote on that? To, or just can we just say we can write a letter to, um, to agree with Commissioner Russo, or Senator Rusan. I think if you all have general consensus, you can just send the letter. Are we okay with that? Yes. I'd be happy to send you, put the draft together, Madam Chair, for you. Great, thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Are we done with that issue? You know, I look forward to the day when we can talk about something other than COVID-19. And here we are. Uh, we're going to talk about our our service districts. Our we have a brief presentations, I guess. Um, so we start with Feather Sound. And Brian will help moderate um, each one of these. And so um, yes, we have five up for you today. And um, Brian, go ahead. I'm going to get uh, Lori Sullivan from OMB on the line, and I think we also have Kevin Chambers, who is in charge of the Feather Sound Community District. Give me one moment here, Madam Chair. And we'll also have Bill Berger from OMB, our director of OMB. Good morning, Kevin. Can you hear us? Good morning, yes. All right, let me see if Lori and... Good morning, Lori. Can you hear us okay? Okay, take it away. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Chambers. I'm the current treasurer of the Feather Sound Community Services District, and um, I'm here to present our fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, I know it's a little bit of a big change in topic <laughs> from what we were previously discussing, but um, Hopefully we can get through it pretty pretty easily. So, um, just to start out, uh, a little bit of background on, on Feather Sound. Um, we're a special district funded by um, taxes in our, our property uh, property tax millage. Um, it's utilized for street lighting and to acquire and maintain and develop green spaces and recreation areas within our community. Our board is made up of seven members. Um, who all live in Reside and in, in Feather Sound. Um, yep, moving on to, to green spaces and, and the things that, that we may maintain here. Um, Kevin, Kevin, you seem to be breaking up a little bit. Can you hear us okay? Nope. Yeah, Madam Chair, I think we're having technical difficulties with this one. Okay. Um, okay. It's Kevin, Kevin, there you back. are. Okay. <laughs> Want to try that again? Sure, Kevin. Um, sorry about that. I don't know where where we got where we lost. Yeah, uh, Kevin. We, we didn't hear you once you went to uh, sharing your screen. And again. Go ahead, Kevin. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, I think we've lost him, Madam Chair. Oh, okay. Sorry, Kevin, we can't hear you when you... Okay, maybe you should just give a verbal presentation. Maybe if we don't share the screen, maybe I can... Yeah, if for right, some I'll reason. try that. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, so I was getting into kind of a little bit of background of what we do with the recreation areas. Um, in the, in the green spaces around Feather Sound. Um, 
Uh, we also maintain and, and lease about uh, 300 streetlights from, from Duke Energy and one of our community improvement projects that we'd like to look at doing within the next year or so is to convert those to LED um, for better energy efficiency and uh, better for the environment and, and they're brighter. Um, in my presentation, which you can't see now, I was going to uh, show a major community improvement project that was just completed. Our entrance sign off of Olmerton Road was just renovated. Um, we put up some new lettering, uh, we kind of brought it into the 21st century, a little more modernization. Um, uh, we're gonna do some landscaping around the sign. So if you guys ever drive, drive past it, um, check it out, it, it's pretty nice. Um, moving on, I was gonna show our, our oh, yep. Yes, Commissioner Welsh, did you have a question? Yeah, I just want to tell Kevin, we do have the slide, so we can see your slide if you just tell oh. us. Oh, oh perfect. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, oh, okay, so then you can see uh, pictures of the, the sign there, that the new sign is, uh, says Feather Sound up there and the bronze lettering is, that was a rendering. Um, it is completed now. So you can um, you can see that the old sign is right below it and there's some pictures there of, of some work being done on the sign. Like I said, the, the landscaping is not completed yet, but we will be um, putting in some nice um, trees and, and flowers and, and landscaping there to, to make the sign look really nice. And at night it looks looks really cool with the, the lights. Um, moving on to the uh, the, ne the next two slides, uh, kind of detail our, our cash flow and uh, proposed and forecasted budgets. Um, we are currently asking for $245,000 from the county to support our annual expenses um, and some community And, or transitioning lights um, to LEDs. Um, we also, I know it's been discussed before, still in, 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 in talks to put a, a dog park in. And so we, we have that in our, in our budget for fiscal year 2021. And so the $245,000 will help um, uh, with some of those community improvement projects and with just our annual expenses. We are asking for no millage increase um, this year. Okay. We have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not really a question, uh, just a reminder for our partners there in Feather Sound that uh, a couple years ago we did an MSTU grant for um, improvements at the Earl Mays Rec Center, the rec area, and uh, for your board to consider that we've got funds in that, uh, in that grant program available. Uh, that your board should be looking at to take advantage of. So just an FYI. Oh. Okay. Anything else? We don't need to vote on anything here, right? This is just informational, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate it. Next up, we have... Um, Palm Harbor Community Services. One moment, Madam Chair. If we could have Jean and Jean Coppola and Eric Linford, if you guys could raise your hands in the Zoom meeting, that way I know um, to promote you here. Thank you very much. Jean, can you hear us okay? Good morning, Commissioners. This is Jean Capola, Library Director of Palm Harbor Library. Good morning. And my colleague, uh, Erica. Good morning, Commissioners. Hey, Erica. Erica, would you like to go first? You know, Jean, you're such a gentleman. Sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> Commissioners, this is such a new, unprecedented time, but I wanted to thank you on behalf of my staff and I'm sure my colleague, for your uh, strong leadership during these times that have help, helped us as partners and citizens um, get through this time. You know, during the first half of the year, we were, uh-oh, uh I see slides going up. Can you still hear me? Oh. Of course, that's feather sound. Yeah, so just oh, pretend, because I don't have fancy slides, but <laughs> during, the, <laughs> during the first half of the year, we were on track to, you know, set records in our events with our touch a truck and our tree lighting and our parade and, and um, 
our Halloween event, and then March happened. And we all know what happened uh, in March. And to your fine words, Commissioner Gerard, I'm tired of hearing COVID-19 as you are. Uh, but we worked a hybrid of remote scheduling as well as uh, on-site scheduling for the 10 weeks that uh, we have been so blessed or unblessed, whichever, with COVID-19. We came back full-time as a staff last Monday on the 18th to prepare uh, to help our residents with some childcare. As you know, summer camp is a huge part of our budget and our programming. And um, we have focused on getting the facilities prepared for that as well after being closed for uh, over two months. We are uh, moving any programming or requests for programming over to Harbor Hall and White Chapel so that these buildings here at the center will just be used for uh, the childcare slash summer camp programs that we run here. Uh, that was obviously a recommendation of uh, my city colleagues as well as the CDC and county and, and state officials. But we are opening Harbor Hall and White Chapel up to our dementia support group and our National Alliance on Mental Illness support group because those are two groups that need uh, some face-to-face -face interaction and hopefully um, we'll take advantage of the space that we're making available. Um, we have changed obviously the way we do business for summer camp. We are not doing any field trips. We are not 100% sure yet uh, what's going to happen with the usage at the YMCA pool or school board facilities. We do have a Zoom call tomorrow with Clint Herbick of Pinellas County Schools and the uh, cities and us will meet to talk about hopefully being able to utilize some of the facilities again for some camp programming. But we've added about 18 sanitizing stations. Um, I believe Commissioner Justice was mentioning how nonprofits have spent uh, some uh, innumerable amounts of money preparing. So we've sanitized both buildings. I've hired a part-time person over the summer and that's their job is they're gonna go behind all these lovely kids and uh, be spraying all these products that we've invested a lot of money in to keep everything as sanitized as we possibly can. Uh, we bought some product available uh, that we found for the playgrounds when we get the blessing to open them. So we'll be spraying them daily um, with a contact that's supposed to kill uh, multi-touch areas for uh, 24 hours. Unlike my colleague, Jean, who doesn't rely so heavily on program and user fees, we will probably see about a 15% uh, loss overall this fiscal year. Uh, we're currently down about 30% in our rentals and our program revenue due primarily to the refunding we've had to do for summer camps and weddings and things that have gotten canceled. I think we'll recover about a, a rough guess of 10 to 15% of that. But I want to rest assure, uh, assure all of you that we have done our due diligence uh, during the good times to put money away in our capital account for improvements and unfortunately it may be needed to be uh, for uh, to our operating budget if we fall short. I don't foresee that happening, but none of us have that crystal ball somebody was looking for earlier. So we do have money in our reserves so that I don't have to put a hand to the county with everything on your plates and say, hey, we need more money. Um, I do again want to reiterate how thankful we are to have the partnership. Staff has been fantastic. Anytime we've reached out with questions or concerns, any emails have been answered promptly, even in, in your remote situation. So I can't thank you enough again for your leadership. I do want to assure you as well that we are still scholarshiping kids into our camp programs. We have told no one no. Uh, my intent is to continue that because obviously now more than ever, people need it. Um, but kind of finding out the same thing you, uh, what I heard this morning with uh, the monies available at the county, we've only, um, given out about 30% of what we budgeted so far for scholarships. So I, I believe that's gonna go up as the summer progresses and people get back to work and we do have that funding set aside. Um, as my dad used to say, this too shall pass and we'll come out on the other side, I'm sure stronger and better. Um, we again, follow your lead and we're thankful for the partnership because without you, obviously we would not exist. And with that, I'd like to just reiterate that we would uh, request formally on behalf of Palm Harbor Parks and Recreation that you continue to support the quarter mill. Any questions? Questions for Erica? No. Nope. This is the first, Thank Commissioner you. Welch. <laughs> That's because I couldn't find my unmute button. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mr. Welch. Prayer That's, answered. Oh. You're, you're as... Um, Eloquent on Zoom is in person, Erica. <laughs> no. I need to get the dictionary out for that, <laughs> eloquent. So it's gotta be another definition than the one I'm thinking. Just thank you and Jean for verifying that I do cross Almerton, just so Dave Eggers knows. 
Thanks. Well, I didn't hear I didn't hear you say that I've crossed Homerton going south. You and Mr. Uh, Justice over there should be able to speak on my behalf. I can't say anything about justice whatsoever. Oh my word. <laughs> thanks. Thanks so much for the great job y'all do. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. And Jean. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Gene Capolo, Library Director of Palm Harbor right. Library. And let me give you some good news. The library is opening up full hours as of Monday. Uh, we'll have fully staffed. Uh, I like to also say uh, East Lake Library is the same as we were. We were the last two libraries in Pinellas County to close in March. We hung out as long as we possibly could because uh, we felt we wanted to provide and continue those services. Uh, up until February, we were doing great with statistics uh, as, as far as the library is concerned. We had about close to 120,000 people already visited the library. We've actually saved up to about $259,000 in volunteer service. And so we were doing very, very well. Unfortunately, this occurred. Um, and now we need to look at the next chapter. But I do want to thank you again for your support for last year's MSTU funds because through your assistance, we were able to purchase a library vehicle, which we never had before. And two of the things we were using a library vehicle, among many things, uh, was to expand our homebound uh, delivery services to the community members here. But one of the cool things we did, and I'm really, really happy about this, is that we were able to partner up with Meals on Wheels. The library was able to adopt a route in Palm Harbor, and every Monday we had staff going out there doing the delivery services. Unfortunately, we had to put that on the back burner for now, but that will continue. So the library vehicle that you sponsored and helped us uh, purchase is directly helping the residents of Palm Harbor. So I want to thank you again for your support because without it, it, not, it, it certainly would not have happened. Um, we've done pretty good up until February. Uh, lots of people coming in using the library. Again, we're seeming to be moving more into that community center type of uh, environment. Uh, a lot of people just come to congregate and so forth. Obviously, that all has changed. So what are we doing now uh, and in the near future? Uh, again, we are going to be opening up on uh, Monday, June 1st, full hours, just staff, no volunteers at all. Uh, we have started curbside pickup, which has turned out to be tremendously successful. And that's really, really working out very, very well. And even though we started that on a temporary basis, I think we may make that a permanent a feature a service for the for the uh, for the residents of Palm Harbor. Um, as far as safety security, uh, sa safety protocols are concerned, as much as what uh, Erica was talking about, uh, in the library, all staff members are required to wear masks. Everybody's required to get the temperature taken before they come into the library. Uh, we don't have the authority to do so, but we will be strongly requesting library members to come in uh, wearing a mask. Obviously, we cannot en enforce that. Uh, we're allowing one hour max for each person to come in so we can spread the wealth around since we're going to be at 50% capacity. Um, the, the only area that we may give a little bit more discretion as far as more than an hour is we've dedicated uh, two of our study rooms to eGov services. So if somebody wants to come in to fill out unemployment uh, information or whatever, I think we're going to allow them to stay in there more than an hour, perhaps an hour and a half, if not more, considering all the frustrations that they go through. We don't add any more stress to their lives. Uh, we've taken a lot of other safety precautions with the, the shield guards, face mask, uh, cleaning throughout the day and throughout the night uh, with computer usage. Anytime we've got this uh, product where uh, after the computer uh, keyboards are used, we spray it. Uh, we step back, it cleans itself and, and until the next person comes on there. We're allowing two sessions per day for computer usage, not back to back. Uh, you have to wait online to come in again to use it so we can be as fair minded as we can. Unfortunately, uh, uh, throughout the summer, uh, through September, we will not allow any activities, uh, programs, uh, or meetings uh, because of the nature of what's going on. But but like with Erica and my other colleagues, we're going to monitor this as, as well as all of you. We're going to monitor this as often as we possibly can. Things may change, hopefully for the better. Uh, frankly, my main concern, uh, one of my main concerns is the possibility of a second wave hitting in the fall. What's going to happen there? So we're, we're, you know, what is that phrase? You, 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 you hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So that's what we're trying to do. I think one of the key things for us is to be as nimble as we can as far as services, um, complete access to materials, uh, computer usage, and so forth. 
stepping up our virtual presence. Um, but unfortunately, and it really goes against the grain of what we do as librarians, it's, it's tough not to provide the services that we normally do uh, on-site and, and, and off-site. Uh, I do want to tell you, though, as a heads up, uh, and I, I think I mentioned this to some of you in the past, uh, that uh, this coming fiscal year in 21 will possibly be the last year that we will be collecting fines. Um, uh, this is an issue that's been going across the United States recently, where a lot of public libraries are getting rid of fines altogether for a variety of, of reasons. Uh, for us here, uh, at Eastlake like Library and Palm Harbor Library, uh, collecting of fines is actually our third main revenue stream. Uh, because unlike a, a county or a city government, where the fines are collected and give it to a general pot and you get back a percentage, we keep all of it. Uh, for Palm Harbor Library, we've been collecting close to, in just fines, about $25,000 a year, which is a lot. Uh, so it looks like uh, all the city is going to be voting on this summer uh, to be effective as of October 1st, um, 2021. So this will be for fiscal year 22, total elimination of fines. Uh, it's not going to hurt them as much as going to hurt East Lake Library and ourselves. I know for a fact we're going to lose at least $20,000, if not more. So that's money i got to figure out where it's going to come from. Uh, but on that happy note, uh, I just want to say thank you for all your past support, especially with a library vehicle, which has been great. And again, a uh, formal request that uh, CSA Palm Harbor and Palm Harbor Library uh, receive the full half mil for fiscal year 21. Is there any questions I can answer for anybody? My only question is the thing about the fines, is that the library co-op that's talking about that? That that is, it was generated by a couple of libraries, uh, and in our library directors meeting, um, just about all the library directors are in favor of that. Other than Lois from East Lake and myself, uh, that has been discussed at the PPLC board meeting. Uh, Lois and myself have spoken to our representatives on the PPLC board, uh, and even if we voted against it, which we will. Uh, and if we decide to continue the fines, that is going to backfire on us because if somebody has an overdue fine, why do I have to go to Palm Harbor? I'll go to Tarpon. I'll go to Dunedin, and they'll waive my fines. So either way, we lose. There's no way that we can get out of this. The only We're fighting a rear guard action at this point right now. The only thing I've requested, Lois and I have requested, is that at least give us a year to prepare for this. So there could be the impact on fiscal year 22. All right, thank you. I I disagree myself. I don't. I'm with you. <laughs> I play. I play. Pay plenty of fines. But, <laughs> Me too. You know, I I think I should. You know, I think it's an incentive to get your books back on time. That's why we like Other each other. People can read them. I mean, <laughs> we'll take it up with the library cooperative. Uh, <laughs> anybody else? So yes, Commissioner so Welch. So Gene, that's about 7% of your revenue if I, if my calculator is working. Something like that. What, what was the, uh, I mean, what was the rationale? Is it a equity issue? Is it a, what, what was the rationale behind it? It started out, um, I'm sure Lois can talk a bit more about this too, but it's starting out that it, the fines are a barrier uh, to access materials for children because they accumulated these fines they no longer, uh, they can use libraries, but no longer can borrow the materials. For me, I think that's a lot of baloney because I'm thinking to myself, oh, you, you, you're borrowing the materials for 30 days. You're allowed to renew it for another 30 days. You can't tell me you can't come in within that time to uh, to, to, to pay the fines. And we're talking, we're talking nickels and dimes we're talking about. So it, it, it became a very kumbaya, honestly. I'm, to be, I'll be perfectly frank. Uh, and I know this is not a scientific or, or a formal way of saying it, but it came a real kumbaya type of feeling, and it's it's spread through wildfire. And once Chicago public did this, and I think New York public and San Francisco, the big ones, uh, then everybody else is catching on right now. So what can I tell you? Okay. I'm just from a different time period. Me too. So it's 30 days before you get a fine? I, I, I'm just no, like, no, you can renew it. You can, you can renew it. 
So it's 60 days. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Gene. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gene. Appreciate My pleasure. It. My pleasure. All right. Any other questions for these guys? Okay. Thank you very thank much, you guys. All right. East Lake. Let me see. I think our next speaker is Lois Enel. Let me see if I can get her. Lois, would you mind? Yeah, you raise your hand. Thank you. One moment here, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Lois, you're going to have to go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, turn your camera on. Okay. Oh, All right. Oh, God, I even put <laughs> earrings and makeup on today. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I echo my colleagues in, in thanking you for uh, what you're having to do during a very difficult time. Um, I don't envy you. I think you're doing a remarkable job. It's kind of like herding cats, and uh, I, I don't envy what you're doing at all. Um, I also want to mention um, after, you know, what Barry had said about, you know, the CARES program and so on. Now that libraries are opening up in Pinellas County, please utilize us to help get the information out for these grants. Um, you know, people come to the library for information. We can set up eGov uh, computers and so on, and we can help get the word out for these county programs. You know, we are your partners and, you know, we're there to help you. So please, um, I want to uh, first talk about, you know, how we've used the funds this past year. Um, as again, my colleague said, we started out great guns. We had our 20th anniversary celebration at Eastlake Library. We had a very popular murder mystery night with a Roaring Twenties theme to go along with our 20th anniversary. Um, yeah, you wouldn't, I don't think you would have recognized me. Okay, in my in my flapper outfit, but uh, okay, that's for another discussion. Um, the funding that we did receive this year from East Lake Library for East Lake Library um, mainly was used for uh, conversion to RFID technology, the radio frequency tags, which included security gates, um, RFID workstations. Um, it's really already improved the patron experience, staff efficiency, and inventory control, and we're hoping to expand on that uh, in the coming year. Uh, we're changing more and more to a self-service model for patrons in parts of the library, not in terms of our customer service model. We still want the one-on-one -on -one personal approach, but we've had a payment module to the self-checkout kiosk. We've purchased a print management system for the self-service payments for print jobs at the public computers. And um, with assistance from community partners, we've expanded a lot of programs and services for seniors and adults, including Tai Chi, fall prevention, painting and drawing classes, and Florida landscaping. Uh, a lot of things we've received help with for programs and new workshops have come from the county and the uh, extension service. So we're really glad to be able to offer these programs. Of course, you know, we also have um, other initiatives, the Florida Humanities Council was able to provide a grant for us and we had three uh, award winning speakers at East Lake before you know the everything fell apart but uh, we had Craig Pittman the author of old Florida and several others that were just terrific. Um, other initiatives, uh, we have decided to uh, move forward with becoming a passport acceptance facility. 10 of our staff members have completed their training as passport agents, which of course, again, is all on hold because there are no passports being issued, but we are ready for this to move forward in the you know, in the coming months so that we can provide this service to uh, people that live in North County. Um, and uh, we are also taking- oh, a, what does that mean? Um, we are able um, to provide uh, passport, uh, we are able to accept just new passport applications, not renewals, okay, for the residents in the, in the North County area. We had to go through a grueling uh, online training program, okay, and we will be licensed 
now as passport acceptance agents and part of the library will be set aside for uh, people to be able to come in and apply for passports. Cool. Mm. Okay. So it's, you know, it's providing a service, but we're also looking at it as a way to provide additional revenue okay, for the, for the library. Okay. So it was a, a win-win situation. Um, the other thing that we've been involved with is the 2020 census. Um, the library was the North County Distribution Center for 2020 census materials. And I tried to take a very active role prior to COVID-19 um, in facilitating information sessions for the public libraries and community groups in Pinellas County. Um, th there's a tremendous committee that in this county that, you know, unfortunately this pandemic has had such a devastating effect, I think nationwide on this initiative. And hopefully we can bring it back when we reopen the library by providing a census station and information for our residents, you know, making them aware of how important it is to complete the census. Um, we, uh, to echo Jean, we have also uh, had a response to the COVID-19 pandemic in preparation for reopening. Um, I'm not going to reiterate everything that Jean said, but it's basically ditto. We've done everything possible, including um, extensive cleaning um, and having our cleaning service come in and do the electrostatic cleaning, the defogging, the acid wash of the of the bare floors and so on. So. You know, we have all of the preventive measures in place. Um, we are following CDC guidelines and mandates from the state and local governments in terms of limiting occupancy, et cetera, to try to, you know, do everything possible. I don't want to be too restrictive and hopefully the uh, patrons when they return will self-police themselves to an extent. Um, again, as Jean mentioned, no, no in-person programs or meetings. Our community room is being used to quarantine return materials, so that makes it unlikely to be available anytime in the near future. Um, we also revamped all of our summer program to reflect the present situation. We have online summer reading programs, virtual programs, take and make activities and a lot of special incentives for our participants. We didn't wanna to do too much virtual programming. I think these kids have been homeschooled and sitting in front of a computer long enough. So we're trying to do whatever we can to you know, get them involved in activities, but not sitting in front of a computer. I homeschooled my seven-year-old granddaughter for three months and I want to shoot myself. Okay, God bless the teachers. I don't think I'd want to do that again. Um, our plans for FY21, and I'm really sorry, this is one thing we didn't have in place when this whole pandemic hit, but we really would like to uh, expedite the investigation and installation of an outdoor materials retrieval locker system, which will give our patrons easy access to library materials 24 seven. So um, that's something that, you know, I really wish we had now, but you know, we are gonna look at that in, in FY21. Uh, creation of an art gallery. We did receive a nice private donation so that we're trying to promote local artists and student artists. And um, we are looking at a, an outreach coordinator position, which also tied into this whole present situation, as well as providing an improved library presence uh, at community events. I want to just finish up by thanking you again for your help and support during a very difficult year for everyone. And uh, I'd like to request that the millage rate remain at the present level so that we can continue to provide services and programs for the residents of North County. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Lois? Yes, Commissioner Wells. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Lois, good to see you again. You look great. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for your great work on the Complete Count Committee. I think you were on the education okay. youth and age friendly committee and yes. you were just just did a yeoman's job um coming down south all around the county but uh, thank you for helping provide access up in east lake for the census just wanted to thank you we we try we, we got out there as much as we could before this hit so hopefully you know with the libraries open again we can continue to promote it but thank you for your kind words thank you so much thank you madam chair thank you anybody else okay thank you lois thank you Eastlake Rick. 
All right, Madam Chair, let me get Mark Sanders. He'll be our next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Sanders, for raising your hand. And let's see if we can get him here. Mark, you're going to have to unmute and uh, turn your video on here. Yeah. I can hear you. All right, I'm just trying. There we go. <laughs> there you are. Hi, Hi guys. Um, well, thank you uh, for your continued support and your service to Pinellas County, everybody. Um, we at uh, East Lake Recreation um, provide an essential service for the community. And we, again, thank you for your support in the past and look forward to your support in the future. Um, we've been closed uh, mostly as most of our uh, activities are uh, youth sports driven. Um, we have opened up an area out at the Meadows Complex for families to use um, as a green space to get some exercise or play catch with their kids, kick the ball around, et cetera. And we just started that this week. Other than that, our complex has been closed. The hours for those open spaces are from nine to six, Monday through Friday. Um, while I'm there to monitor the situation. <clears throat> As you know, I don't have a staff, so it's pretty much just me out there manning the complex. Um, in the past, we've addressed many of the issues that um, East Lake Recreation was founded on. We have kept our participation fees uh, low, in many cases lower than the, uh, rec or the participation fees in the surrounding area. Um, we've done uh, much work on our infrastructure, improving our infrastructure at the facilities, electrical, uh, irrigation. We've provided uh, pretty much all new lighting throughout the complex and much of it being brand new LED lighting, uh, which also saves energy um, and dollars for us. Um, the times we're in, now are difficult um, and it's it's different because as I said in the past that um, I'm kind of a one-man operation out there so I don't have a whole staff um, but what we have done is I've asked all my sports organizations to submit plans for reopening and how we're going to do that in a safe and responsible way have those plans we're um, we're trying to implement them but I don't really foresee how we can do this for organized sports until we reach phase two. I think trying to have uh, 10 or less people on a field is something that's very difficult to do to have a practice or anything organized. Uh, so that being said, we're um, kind of in a waiting pattern. Um, I have another advisory board meeting tonight where we're gonna just discuss things further. Uh, so that's where, where we're at. I, I'm really happy with um, what we've done in the past. I'm thankful for the dollars that you've got, given us, especially through the MSTU funds, where we've been able to purchase new shade structures, additional seating with bleachers. Uh, we've, put, we've increased our security measures. We've added gates. So um, I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, looking forward to opening up the facilities um, totally, but we want to make sure that we um, are able to implement the plans that we have in place. So um, I do have some questions uh, of, of you all, but um, first I'll ask if there's any questions that you may have. Uh, yes, Commissioner Akers. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for your report. Um, I just, uh, again, I've been a, to a couple of your 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 all's meetings, uh, your uh, the directors' meetings specifically, and um, I know there's some interest in folks that are up in your area to be able to, uh, especially while you're there uh, during the day, to access the fields, uh, the little league fields, especially the baseball diamonds, to be able to hit, you know, do some fungo and do hitting in the cage and that kind of thing. Um, with obviously any kind of signage that says if somebody's on the field, please wait your turn. 
but I, I just wondered if if your advisory group is is considering that uh, even before phase two. I mean, we're not talking about organized practice. We're just talking about letting fee, letting folks uh, get out there and try to uh, try to get some practices. Uh, I've seen it really throughout the throughout the North District, just in different fields. But just your thoughts on that? Well, that is one of the things we'll be discussing tonight. Um, some of the fear that we had in doing that is that um, since our, our organization um, does pay for a lot of the upkeep on their fields, they just, the baseball team just put, uh, baseball league just put about $25,000 worth of maintenance into their field, which was just completed. And um, I know some of the concerns that they have is that opening up our complex um, would provide many of these um, organized club teams, travel teams from using our facilities for practice. But I think um, if we do what, what you're talking about doing, I think that's something that we can definitely work out and we'll be working on that tonight to be coming, uh, coming up with a plan where I'm hopefully that, hopefully that we can implement by June 1st. Yeah. And just, just to, just a second uh, other thing is just make sure that uh, I know the governor's order came out on Friday or Saturday that that uh, that opens the the youth sports arena um, and so I just want to make sure that uh, that uh, I mean, I'm sure your your advisory group is well aware of it and is considering all of that as well so thank you Mark yes we've been working on uh, on this. Uh, diligently for quite some time and have been going back and forth. And originally, we that's why we provided the green space open is for people to come in and actually uh, exercise and uh, be able to throw a ball around. That, that being said, it wasn't open, the batting cages weren't open and the diamonds weren't open for that kind of uh, activity. But we will be discussing that tonight and hopefully we'll come up with a plan that will uh, satisfy everyone involved, a workable plan. But you, you spoke of the governor's order on Friday, which kind of left us all hanging there um, <laughs> Friday afternoon before a holiday weekend. And I was wondering um, how it, there was some tournaments, baseball tournaments this weekend that I've looked into. And I was wondering how they could, could, could still do that if we're still in phase one. So I was confused by the governor's order. If we're still in phase one, how can you have more than 10 people on a field at a time? How are you gonna be, be able to maintain that six foot distance? Or did his order mean that's totally done, the phase is done, and then he kind of passed the buck on, well, state mun or, uh, local municipalities and government agencies can make their own um, rules so to speak, or policies on that. And I was wondering, as a group of county commissioners, have you discussed this? And will there be a plan coming out for youth sports from Pinellas County? Well, welcome to our world with confusing <laughs> orders from Tallahassee. Uh, Barry, <laughs> Barry, do you want to respond to that? Uh, so Mark, we, um, at, we have a uh, executive policy group that's uh, made up of uh, different individuals we, where we come together and we've been trying to review the governor's order and interpret them now for over two months. And, and like you said, we received um, that order on Friday that it simply said that they, they, he was lifting the restriction on use of ports, didn't provide any additional clarification. There was no additional discussion. There was no advance notice or guidance in terms of what is expected out of that order. Um, so we're we're left in limbo the same way as you, and unfortunately, what that means is different interpretations of how to apply that order. So it doesn't surprise me at all that some said that you know we're not exempted from the ten the groups of ten or things like that, um, because you know the the phase one, phase two, the reopening Florida plan is very specific and it has different things in that. Um, when you issue an order that's separate and outside of that, you're you don't know whether to apply that piece of it and then keep the rest of the phase one or phase two order or does are you exempting that out and so that there is that lack of clarity there and, I, and I, so i don't have a good response for you i know some have opened up some have tried to uh, do drills and do types of events where they could keep the kids separated 
um, you know, and kind of do a modified plan to allow the teams to get going. Um, but there's there's really no further guidance from the state on that. Well, I, I was very impressed with yesterday, um, all the local um, soccer clubs in the area, and I don't know if you've seen it, kind of came to United Front and decided not to have their tryouts um, until like June 15th. And they all, each one of the directors of, of their organizations, uh, they made a video and um, it, was, it was a great solidarity video. And I will send it to you if you haven't seen it. But um, I was hoping that, you know, maybe some of the other sports could could take a lesson from that group because I thought it was it was a great video and they they were showing solidarity coming together and they're all on the same page where not one organization is is uh, you know trying to be first to do something. Any other questions for me? Well, I just like to thank everybody for um, their continued support, and I would hope that you would um, consider keeping our millage rate at the 0.25 percent as uh, as it has been in the past. And again, thank you for your service to Pinellas County and all you're doing in these difficult times. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right. Uh, Library Cooperative. We have Cheryl Morales, Madam Chair, and she should be here in one second. Yep, there she is. Cheryl, can you hear us okay? There you are. Uh, we can't hear you. Are you muted? No. We can see you, Cheryl. We can't hear you. Hmm. Cheryl, can you hear us or no? Huh. Yeah, I think your microphone volume is way, way down right now. We we may need to either increase it or have you call in on the phone line. Either one would be fine. Yeah, Madam Chair, we're having technical difficulties with, with Cheryl. Can't hear you. Uh, we can, your volume is way, way low. You're gonna have to turn up the volume on the microphone on, on your computer. <laughs> What's your phone number? Uh, let me give you the phone number. Um, one moment. So you're going to call 646-558-8656. And you're going to put in an attendee ID number. It's 238-247-671. And after you do that, hit star nine and we'll patch you through to the panel. All right, Madam Chair, uh, we're gonna have to give her a minute. I don't know if you wanna take a five minute break or something like that. Yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Okay, we're gonna take a five minute, how about a 10 minute recess? Sounds great. Okay.
that's okay. I can hear you, and you can hear me. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, you're on. Okay, thank you. Well, it's so good to see all of you today, and, and more of you coming back. <laughs> um, you know, normally I present charts and graphs and a, a colorful slideshow with all the data on the activities over the past year um, with projections for the next year. But, but because we're in the middle of this very unique situation, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit different story. And there is a little video included that I, I hope you'll enjoy. So in the beginning of March, member libraries began to limit services like classes, events, and group meetings, not really knowing you know, what the immediate future was going to look like. And so remember when we thought this was going to be a two week kind of thing? We thought libraries were going to be closed for two weeks. Um, mm. I, I certainly remember that, even though it seems like it was five years ago now. Um, but by March 20th, all the member libraries were closed to the public. And by March 30th, 90% of the library staff were ordered to stay at home by their municipal. Um, governing um, authorities. Two, all the buildings were locked down. Um, two of the libraries did remain open because their authorities allowed them to, and they provided a different level of services to their communities, while all libraries provided some level of, of services, um, even while the staff were at home. The libraries Many libraries remained um, drop-off locations for returning of library items. Uh, a few libraries had reemployment forms available outside their building for people that had trouble getting online to do the application. Uh, many libraries provided take-home kits for children and families to do projects at home. Uh, the telephone services, online services, huge increase in uh, expenditures and usage of electronic items like ebooks, e-audio, e-magazines, as well as streaming services for films and online courses. And library staff themselves spend a great deal of time doing online courses from home. So there was a big continuing education factor involved. Um, and one library in the county even worked with Pinellas County Schools to provide free breakfast and lunches to their communities throughout this whole um, lockdown. Within PPLC, the Deaf Literacy Center and the Talking Book Library continue to serve Pinellas uh, County residents as usual. The Deaf Literacy Center staff worked out of the PPLC building. Uh, because normally they work out of Safety Harbor, but that building was locked down. Uh, so they worked out of the PPLC building to provide services via video calls and online lessons. The Talking Book Library provided the normal books by mail services to Pinellas County residents, while also adding delivery to residents throughout the state. And that was a necessity because more than half of the very few Talking Book Libraries in the state there are only about eight or nine of them, more than half of them were closed because they're housed in library buildings that had to be closed. So PPLC picked up a lot and a lot of uh, loaning of books and their workload increased by over 100% a day, uh, serving the rest of the members of the state. So I do have a very short video that I hope you'll find entertaining that kind of illustrates what libraries were able to do for their community while they were closed. During the Safer at Home order, effective March 26, 2020, PPLC member libraries were closed to the public. While working from home, library staff developed innovative ways to reach out and serve their communities. Pinellas Public Libraries are planning for reopening and will continue to use these methods to provide services and keep people safe at the same time. Here's a brief look at how some library staff reached out to families at home. So guess what guys? It's story time! Yay! Hello everybody and how are you? Hello everybody, how are you? 
here to show you this week's craft. They are in bags sitting outside the library, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, and the bottom, like that. And that's it. We are going to be reading Outer Space Bedtime Race. Love Z by Jesse Seema. Do you truck? Not me, buddy. I called for a dump truck. Today, we're going to do a Spark Lab Stream Club craft program. And let's see how it sounds. Pretty good sound. I like that. And this is the way we wash our hands. Wash our hands. Wash our hands. They even sparkle while her daddy reads her a story about a wild and wicked monster. <laughs> I think I know what story she's reading. <laughs> Hello, are you Beatrice? No, said a voice. What's a Beatrice? Peekaboo! <laughs> Good job! Thanks, Brian. I mean, some of them really got into it. <laughs> yeah, it was fabulous. Uh, so moving forward, by June 1st, all the public libraries in the county will be open, except for two of the St. Pete branches because they're joint use facilities. So the owner of those properties, um, and that's St. Pete College Gibbs campus, library and the Child's Park Library, and that is a YMCA facility. Those will remain closed until further notice, but all of the other 22 uh, locations will be open to the public. And while, while getting ready to open, and, and some are already open, um, they have varied um, services, varied changes. Some are having limited hours, opening for two hours in the morning, closing for two hours while they clean everything and then open again for another two hours. Um, the limited services, like uh, Jean mentioned, not having mass amounts of people in the building, no meetings, no group sessions. Uh, curbside delivery will remain a thing. It, it became very popular. And, and as you know, a lot of people are really not wanting to go into a building where other people are yet. They still um, have some trepidation. Uh, so the curbside delivery has been very popular. The virtual classes and events, like some of the things that you just saw on YouTube, on their Facebook channels, they will uh, continue those. And having the take-home kit available outside the building for people to take home and do crafts with their kids. And then the online offerings will be um, also very popular. Um, a lot of people who had never had a library card before were able to sign up for a virtual library card so they could take advantage of the online offerings, the eBooks and the classes and, and things that libraries offer online. So, um, I didn't have this on my agenda to talk about with you, but because it came up. So I'm not sure exactly what came of that. So keep that in mind. I will let I, you know. <laughs> as I make my comments, thank you. Because in my opinion, the presentation that we heard at our last meeting did not at all address the issues that I saw out there on Saturday, which quite frankly, I thought when we took our vote, I knew since my family and I had spent almost every single weekend out there years ago when we had our own boat. So that said, how things have changed, including the way in which the area is configured now versus back then. And so number one, we never talked about the seaplanes. Number two, we, we did not talk about the jet skis. Number three, we did not talk about the camping, the tents, the big loose dogs the kayaks, the current, the alcohol, the enforcement, and the problems that the sheriff has with regard to how restricted our marine uh, services 
given the results of something the county commission did in 2010, and we have never, in, as long as I've been here, gone back to correct it. The one thing I want to state unequivocally is the boaters are not the problem. Let me tell you something. People who own boats are part of a large community. That community is enormous respect, respectful of one another because they have a lot of money tied up in these boats. So when they come up close to the beach on Bunce's Pass, they're very, very careful about how they come up, how fast they go, how well they tie their boats off to make sure they're anchored properly, one anchor in the front, one anchor in the back, so they don't drift back and forth into each other. And for the most part, they're families, people with children, and they're, they're not rowdy, they're not causing trouble, they're just having a beautiful day, enjoying the area and the, and the paradise that we have all why we live here. I felt it was important to say that because while yes, there are a large number of boats there, it's very secure. The swimmers are most normally in between where the boats are anchored and the beach. Um, you, you've got to be able to get off your boat and get onto the beach, which sometimes can be quite a distance depending on how far you anchor out and or when the tides come and go. So all of that to say, um, the biggest factor that is an accident waiting to happen in my opinion, is there's no wake zone through there. The current is, oh my God, you just cannot believe how fast that current goes. And the boats are flying through there. The seaplanes are going to, you know, zigzagging in and around the boats. I mean, it's just an accident waiting to happen. On top of that, you, you become very aware that there are lots of young tourists who have rented a jet ski. These people have no clue about the rules of the waterways. They bounce in between and jump over. They try to jump over the waves that are going in between the boats. It's incredibly dangerous. I mean, we had to bring our boat to a standstill because there was a jet ski jumping over the waves from the boat in front of us. And we almost hit the guy because he came right in front of us just like that. So um, I think there's a lot of other things that we need to be talking about. And we need input, not only from the sheriff and his team, we need input from the Coast Guard and Fish and Wildlife, who are all doing their best to try to maintain a safe environment out there. But I'm telling you the one thing because of my past life that came into my head is, oh my goodness, I wonder who has the liability out here if there's a horrific accident. And it's just a matter of time. So I really encourage us to just null and void whatever we did at the last meeting. I don't think, and I also would like to encourage all of you to uh, take the sheriff up on his offer and go out on his marine vessel and see for yourself how the whole area is being enjoyed by our citizens. And with that, I'll stop now because I can really wax on about it. I was just so upset. We, we walked along the beach for a long, long way. My littlest grandchild is two years old and he's trying to run up to these huge, great, big um, black Labrador, beautiful dogs, just who were just having a ball splashing around in the water and running back and forth on the beach. And when they saw him, they wanted to come right up to him and I was terrified. So, I mean, great, you wanna have your dogs out there? I get it, but put them on a leash. Okay, I'm, all, I'm done. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, Commissioner Peters. Commissioner Peters. Man, what is she doing? I don't know. Commissioner Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. My comment was, I didn't know how many people wanted to speak on the answer of that. We're gonna reduce time. 
time, if, if there's 10 or if there's 20, 100, then absolutely, I would agree with you. So that was why I put it up to begin with. Um, I want to concur with Commissioner Long. Now, I went in the helicopters, um, the sheriff's helicopter on Saturday, and I did send some photos to Brian. I don't know if you can put them up or if it's worth watching, but um, based on the parking lot, I, I feel that the photographs that I took are not comparable to the drawings that we made our decision off of last week. Um, and if you, I don't know, Brian, if you can put those, can you pull those up or no? Where did you send them, Commissioner Peters? I'm not. Uh, Ashley supposedly had sent them to you, so if she didn't, don't don't worry about it. But I'm not seeing them. Okay, so um, so based <clears throat> on what I saw from the air, um, that north parking lot, many of the beach doors are going north, uh, up in front of the lagoon, and very few of them are going out to the perimeter. Some are, but very few of them are going out to the perimeter where we now have stopped access for boats. Um, I do have great concerns on that current. If swimmers, if boats had to, if the family members had to swim 150 yards in past that swimming zone, I think it would be incredibly dangerous. And we'd have way more um, uh, loss or, or water rescues, if not drowning. So um, I am really concerned about that. I'm not going to believe this. I made my, my argument last week. Um, but I really think that we ought to reconsider that. Um, I do have a problem with the lagoon. I think if the lagoon were to stay closed, and I, I don't have a problem with the lagoon being limited to um, swimmers and so forth, but I'm not okay with eliminating kayakers and paddleboarders. I'm an avid paddleboarder, and that current is so strong. And if you paddleboard and you're not experienced paddleboarder and you get caught out in that current outside um, in the Gulf, that would be extremely dangerous. Um, and for a new beginner to learn how to paddleboard, that lagoon is an ideal place. The fact that we're going to ban kayakers and, and paddleboarders in the lagoon, I think, is, is not necessary. My hope is that you're going to overturn this ruling and we're going to take a little more time and do something that's more appropriate for everyone. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Long, for bringing this back. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we have a couple more uh, there have been several suggestions uh, short of banning all vehicles from that area. I think we, I think there are some compromises and we talked about some of them at the, with the Boat Owners Association yesterday, but uh, Mr. Seal. Thank you, Commissioner Gerard. Um, I um, also visited land, sea and air. <laughs> So I walked Port DeSoto for about an hour the other day. I went on the Marine Patrol and then I've also been up in the helicopter as well. So I concur with um, many of the comments that have been made. Um, I'm glad that the personal, I did the personal observation. Um, we also received a letter from Captain Font um, that has some excellent suggestions and um, rationale behind it. But I do believe and I am so sorry, because normally we would have vetted this through a much more rigorous um, public process. And um, that's not normally how we have in the past addressed important matters such as this that affect so many people. So I hope we do slow down, go back out and really hear people and shape a policy that is safe, but also provides access. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Welch. Yeah, I, I just echo my uh, colleagues. I'm certainly willing to reconsider this as well. And I think part of this is, you know, we're in this Zoom environment. Um, you know, I replied to a bunch of those emails. I couldn't do reply to the ones that came in yesterday. Um, but, you know, this was discussed at two meetings. And I think if we were in our normal mode, maybe more folks would have picked up on that. But, um, you know, I asked folks when I replied to them, what do you suggest? And we did get a lot of good suggestions including captain font and some others so i'm looking forward to seeing what your conversations were madam chair uh the only other thing i would add though um with all due respect we did talk about the seaplanes uh quite a bit and uh i tried to send y'all a video yesterday it was over 100 megs i don't know if you got it or not i got it um, but yeah, it's, frightening it's, yeah the seaplanes have been my main concern i'm a land lover I, I ride a motorcycle not a not a boat um, so I'm going to have to take the experts, um, recommendations for what we do with swimmers and boaters, but those seaplanes, it just looks like 
an accident waiting to happen. And I know that uh, the sheriff said last time we can't address that, but I would uh, like us to explore who can address it because to me that was one of the things, the thing that stood out the most in terms of safety. So thank you for bringing this back, Commissioner Long. Right, but also in that video, I saw several boats just zooming by. Yes. That, that was also a bit concerning. Yeah. Uh, no wait zone. Right, right. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I would echo my colleagues, echoing my colleagues' uh, comments. <laughs> um, when we heard about it Thursday, I was surprised that we didn't have a more in-depth discussion. And then when we had Tuesday, and we really had no public comment on it, uh, it was a little surprising to me. So I thought that we were kind of further along in the conversation. Um, the one thing I would say is that there's a lot of personal attacks on Mr. Kazi that we've received um, and seen out there in the online world, which I think is inappropriate, but um, I'm fine. I think we should have a, a more thorough discussion about this, make sure. The one thing we wanna make sure is we never want our public to feel like they didn't have an opportunity to share their views and give their input and have a, a good uh, viewing of their thoughts. So uh, I'm all for that as we move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, same here. I think uh, I think we have consensus that we'd like to uh, not implement what we the decision that we made the other day until we have some time to talk through some options, um, and that's certainly doable. Uh, one of the things that we had to do ahead of time, what, or before we could even implement that, was to send it to the state and get approval. So I assume we're not doing that. Is that something we need to vote on? But we can do later, but yeah, Commissioner Peters, I'll get you in a second. Um, Jewel. I'm sorry, Commissioner, could you repeat the question? I'm actually trying to well, look I have the statutes right now. <laughs> Last week we decided to do this thing. Do we have to, and part of that was to submit this plan to the state. Uh, do we have to, undo that today, Part we don't have to do, because- of what you did last week, you the, the zone would not become effective until signage was put in place. And right. to, my, to my knowledge, we have not even begun the, the permit approval process to place those signs. Right. So the zones would not be inf effective or, or really enforceable okay. um, until those, sign that those signs are placed. Now, depending on what sort of zone you pass out there, it may very well need FWC approval just regardless of the, the signage or not. Mm -hmm. So, and that's something that you would get after the fact. And there's different types of zones out there. Um, and I'm actually was just looking at the statutes and really depending on what you do would dictate whether we would need to get FWC, Florida oh. Fish and Wildlife Commission approval of the okay. ordinance, notwithstanding that possibility of approval, the signage has to go in and we definitely need to get permits to place the signage in the waterway. All right. Um, Mr. Peters. I just want to make a comment about that FWC approval because, um, you know, it was obvious I wasn't pleased with the decision that happened last week. So I called Fish and Wildlife to ask them what the process was for them to approve it. And they said, that's not their responsibility. They don't approve those plans. Now they may provide the permit for the signs, but they don't approve the plan. So I just wanted that to be clear that that's not the case. And, um, and I don't know if we need a motion to overturn that decision last week and if that's what we we need uh, to make that motion and look for a second. Um, and I would be happy with all the input we've got. It was pretty clear the consensus was to put a no-wake zone around that perimeter. Um, and since there are people speeding by and it is impacting the, sea do uh, and the sand dunes that are on the within the inside of the pass, it may be worth just doing that no-wake zone now, um, kind of repealing what we did last week but putting in that no-wake zone. And then if we want to look at things for the lagoon or look for things with dogs or look for um, other things, even if we do a no-wake zone now, the seaplanes would have to adhere to the no-wake zones. Um, and many of those seaplanes, although the videos look like they're really, really close, just like when we take a picture from the land on the beach, the beach looks more crowded. But when you take it from a different perspective up in the air, you can see that there's a lot more space than what it looks like when you take the video from the ground. So I think we have to keep that in mind when we looked at photographs and videos. Um, and most of those seaplanes get far away from boats and, and people before they um, ramp up speed. But when they come into the shoreline, they have to idle. So I think because it is a danger now, we really ought to put the no-wake zone in right now. 
Um, so if, if you'd entertain a motion for that, I would put in that we put in the, that we would repeal last week's decision and put in a no wake zone now, and then let the parks department work on other areas in which that area needs to be looked at. You cannot take action at this meeting. Um, that would have to be done by ordinance and the ordinance has to be properly noticed for 10 days in advance of holding a public hearing. Okay. So we can undo what we did last week. Well, no, you can't because you would have to rescind that ordinance. Now, you can direct staff not to pursue the permits for the signage, which need right. to be put in place in order for the zone to be enforceable and effective. Right. Okay. So, Jewel, does this mean that we have to put this on the agenda for Tuesday or the following it, week? It has to be noticed that? for 10 days. It could not be heard on Tuesday. Joe, if I can, if, if, uh, if the direction from the commission is to not take further action regarding pursuing the permits necessary to put the signage and the buoys and things like that in place, um, and if that's the direction of the commission, we can do that. At that time, then we can also take and redo the public hearing process and the notice requirements where you have a public hearing date where all sides then are heard and you can consider different optional alternatives uh, uh, but done so to where everybody has been properly noticed and has an opportunity to opine, you know, on their, their, their feelings regarding that at a later date. Okay. <laughs> um, Commissioner Long. Yes, I just wanted to request that, that you know, we, we seem to have a consensus about what we want to do. And I'd sure like to hear from some of our citizens, given they've been waiting so long. Right. And then when they're done, we can, you know, move forward. But to keep them waiting while we keep on repeating the same kind of things doesn't seem to be very respectful. Right. Mr. Eggers. Yeah, just real quick, I'm assuming with this action, um, even though the ordinance is still in place, that um, we uh, we can direct the uh, the sheriff to uh, wait as well uh, for the outcome of a, of a of a second hearing. Or there wouldn't be a this ordinance is effective. You don't require second hearings on these types of ordinances. But again, there's no signage out there. Um, without the signage, it's really not enforceable. Okay, that's that was really that was my question, and and so we will be bringing an ordinance. Is the action that we're talking about today is bringing uh, an ordinance to repeal that in a couple of weeks? Is that what we're talking about? Yes, at a future at a future date, we could, and then we would probably okay. notice it. And okay, do we need right. to? Um, do we need to vote to have uh, to give staff direction not to do anything with? I, I don't think that you do on any of these issues that we're talking about today. I feel like the consensus of the board is clear. I mean, really what you all need to take a vote on is modifying your ordinance, which would be uh, potentially repealing what you did previously, potentially impo imposing a different sort of zone for safety reasons. Um, that those are really the votes that you have to take. And like I've said, you can't you can't do that at this meeting. Um, but certainly staff is hearing your direction and can bring back an appropriate ordinance. Um, at an appropriate time. Okay, great. So for those who are waiting, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. If if we can, if there's consensus, at least consensus to have the topic of on that same agenda, having a, a um, the no wake issue so that we could take action. From what I talked to the attorneys, um, that one does require FWC approval. So that's something that we would have to submit for approval. Uh, so that would not something that we can go out and put a sign today. I would second that Madam Chair, because that is the crux of a lot of these other issues is the fact there's no wake zone out there. Right, but we can't do either of the, we can't do that either, right? Not to not today, but certainly right. for that, whatever that next public meeting that we have the repeal on, right? we could have that same conversation that day. So. It's not another month before we're taking oh, action on that absolutely. as we're going to a full plan on the entire area. Absolutely. Okay. Um, again, for those of you who are waiting to speak and it'll be just a second, we are not going to implement for now, we're giving staff direction right now that we are not going to implement what we decided last week. Um, we can't undo the, or the ordinance right now. We have to notice that but we will not be going forward with that. So 
keep that in mind as you're making your comments. Um, and we certainly have gotten a lot of suggestions from you all. So the floor is yours. At, at, this at this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak on this item, uh, please hit star nine if you're coming in on the telephone line or raise your hand virtually in the Zoom meeting. And Madam Chair, it appears we have about eight speakers that wish to address the commission. Okay. Uh, our, our first speaker is Tammy. Uh, Tammy, if you'll go ahead and give us your first last name, spelling, address, and uh, you'll have two minutes to address the commission. Hi, my name is Tammy Vasquez, it, last name V-A-S-Q-U-E-Z, and treasure, uh, reside in Treasure Island. Okay. Um, I first, as everyone else, would like to thank Commissioner Long for bringing this issue back to the commission for further discussion. Um, I think there's no doubt that the previous decision was rushed through without proper vetting or notice to the public so that we could have uh, the input that we are due. Um, I've been boating these waters for the majority of my life, and sadly, the number of places the boaters have to enjoy by water has dwindled greatly, and we just aren't ready to give up this area without valid reason. As Commissioner Long stated, um, I definitely think there are a few things that could be compromised um, to address the safety concerns. Um, I believe in reference to the lagoon, you could definitely make it a no weight zone. It's mostly about two to three feet deep. So anyone speeding through there are generally personal watercrafts, as you stated. Um, those, those things are definitely dangerous, there's no doubt. Um, but the boaters, the boaters are typically very, very safe. Um, a no wake zone solves that problem of the safety in the lagoon and I believe would be very welcome by the boating community. The seaplanes um, by proxy, if that's a no wake zone, I don't believe, I mean, I don't fly a plane, but I don't believe they would even be able to take off if that out of the lagoon, therefore they couldn't land there um, because they wouldn't be able to get up to speed. Um, the real problem and the main reason most boats anchor in the lagoon to begin with is the pass that runs between Shell Key and Fort DeSoto from the boat launch to the Gulf. It's basically a raceway, as you uh, mentioned, Commissioner Long. Boats fly through there, causing it to be extremely challenging to anchor on the north side of what's known as Bunce's Pass, not to mention the wake tossing the, anchor, uh, the anchored boats around. Most boaters, I believe, would completely agree with making uh, that a minimum weight zone in that pass, therefore making it safer to use the outside of Bunces. Shutting down a, uh, another one of our amazing waterways just truly isn't the answer, but I believe a minimum wake could be. The proposed swim buoy- Ms. Vasquez, I'm sorry, your, your, your time is, uh, has expired. Oh, that was three minutes? Okay. Well. <laughs> Are we doing two or three, Madam I Chair? Was, I, um, if we've only got eight people on there, I guess we can do three. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tammy. I'll give you an extra. Sorry. Minute. Oh, no worries. No worries. <clears throat> um, I think most uh, boaters would definitely agree with a minimum wake zone um, so, that, so that we could use that area. Um, going to the, the swim buoy areas, and I believe... Um, Commissioner Peters touched on this. You had proposed a swim area of 100 to 150 yards off the island. Definitely the biggest fear is with the dangerous currents that far off the beach, anybody trying to swim in from their boats to the island could definitely get caught in the current and drown. We all work very, very hard during the week so that we're able to enjoy these amazing waters to fish, boat, and enjoy the beach with our families. And I thank you for um, trying to overturn the changes that the majority of you voted for last week. Um, and I do ask that you consider these suggestions, a no wake zone in the lagoon, a minimum wake zone in the pass, and doing away with the swim buoy areas altogether. I believe the 8,000 plus signatures of the boaters have spoken and we really hope you all listen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker, I don't have a name for, I think it's the same gentleman that spoke on the first item coming in from a Galaxy X8. If you can give us again, for the record, your first and last name, uh, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Thank you, uh, Randy Matchers, M-A-T-S-C-H-E-R-Z, uh, address 5110 South Manhattan, Tampa. Um, 
I, my perspective comes as a kite surfer. Um, we feel a shutdown of this area would be very detrimental to uh, our access as well. And my question is, what uh, does a no wake zone uh, and how would that impact the kite surfing community there? I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, for reference, my understanding is that often kite surfing is lumped in with kayaking and paddle boarding in terms of uh, the type of vessel uh, that a kite board is. And then uh, resultantly, uh, if uh, kayaks and uh, paddle boards are not affected by a no wake zone, then kite, kite surfers would not be either. And I just want clarification on that point, if possible. We will get clarification before we vote on this again, which will be in about two weeks. Is on the line. Okay, Paul, do you have any information about that? We'll get Paul here in one second. Give me a minute. Okay. Paul, can you hear us? Yes. There you um, are. No, I am. I, that would actually. Uh, require some legal interpretation. Um, I believe, though, that wherever kayaks and paddle boards are allowed, that kite surfers are also allowed. So, um, but I would I would uh, defer to to legal on the various vessel definitions. Wonderful. Wonderful. I appreciate that. Uh, as you know, uh, or may not know, Tampa Bay is one of the premier kite surfing water areas in the entire world. Um, we are blessed to have uh, square miles of shallow waters in which to learn and practice. And uh, it's become uh, a source of uh, revenue for our small businesses and also certainly a source of recreation. And honestly, as a 59-year-old man, I recommend all of you give kite surfing a try. Go see Aaron at Elite Water Sports and uh, he'll get you set up. Thank you. Next issue. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Mr. Tyler Payne. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry, I just lost him. Hold on one sec. Tyler, give me one moment. Thank you if you put your hand back up. Tyler, can you hear us okay? I can, thank you. All right, go ahead, sir. You have three minutes. All right, good afternoon, commissioners. This is Tyler Payne, Treasure Island City Commissioner. and also third generation Pinellas County resident and voter. Um, thank you for revisiting this subject today. I appreciate your concern for the safety of our boaters and beachgoers at Port DeSoto, and I thank you all for taking that into consideration in your previous decision. However, uh, there are some other considerations I would like, you to, like to encourage you to take into account today, and I'm encouraged to hear that you're already considering some of these items. First of all, you have to think about how this will impact other areas of the county. This is one of the most popular sandbars in the county, and the current plan would drastically reduce the boat capacity, and those boats will shift to other sandbars in the county, most notably Johns Pass Sandbar, which lies between my city of Treasure Island and Madeira Beach. Johns Pass is already extremely crowded on busy weekends, so pushing more boats to that location is just going to shift the safety problem, not eliminate it. And this imposes additional enforcement burden on our single Treasure Island Marine Patrol. Um, secondly, I would encourage you to consider the boating culture of our county as Tammy so eloquently spoke to. Um, our county is surrounded by water, especially for those of us who live on our coastlines. Boating is an integral part of our lives here in Pinellas County. And it's a part of what makes where we live so attractive to new residents and also to visitors. I'm sure you'll hear um, this from numerous others, but our options for boating destinations in the county are rapidly diminishing. Last, I'd encourage you to consider the tourism impact. Now, this one may not be abundantly obvious, but I believe it should be considered. When I was growing up, my family and I would travel by boat to nearby communities like Sarasota, Venice, Fort Myers, Sanibel, Naples, and Captiva. We'd also go to other locations within the county like Dunedin, Clearwater, and Tarpon Springs. These are all fantastic boating communities with ample places to dock up and spend the weekend um, for, for families. One of my goals as commissioner in Treasure Island has been to make the city more boater friendly. Um, 
when visitors come by boat, they support our local businesses like marinas and restaurants. And if we can make our whole county more boater friendly, we have an opportunity to increase our tourism. But this closing down a very popular sandbar would not make our community more boater friendly. I do understand the safety issues in the lagoon area. So as a compromise, I think that area could be remain closed to motorized vehicles, but please keep the outer area completely open and allow kayaks and paddle boards in the lagoon. Uh, additionally, I think no wake zones within 200 to 300 yards of the shore and throughout Bunces Pass would be very reasonable along with other precautions like dogs on leashes, like Commissioner Long mentioned. Um, Otherwise, thank you for your time and your consideration, and um, it's good to see all your faces. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Christine Shelton. Uh, Ms. Shelton, if you can go ahead and give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good morning. My name is Christine Shelton, and I live in the Patrician Point area. I've lived here all my life, and I've been a boater for probably 35 years now. And everything that everyone has said so far, as far as Tammy and Tyler and Commissioner Long and Peters is right online with everything I had written out, but I'm not gonna spend the time reading that because a lot of you have said a lot of the things that I do agree with. The one thing I want you to just seriously consider is the economic impact that the boating community has on this area and to com continue to cut us out of areas for us to safely go would just be a mistake. I mean, we spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on our boats and equipment and toys and restaurants and gas and food and tolls and you name it, we're, we're, we contribute to that. So, you know, please consider our needs and, and desires to have a safe place to go. And I completely agree with what Tyler had said as well about if you push us out of this area, we will find another. And this is a large, large area and it certainly can be equipped to handle the number of boats that go there. And I, I do disagree with shutting, out, shutting down the lagoon for motorized vehicles. They just need some rules and most people do follow them. In fact, most boaters won't go in there because their boat either can't handle it because it's too deep of a boat for the hull of the boat to get in there or they're just afraid of the tide changing and getting stuck in there. So, you know, most people are smart enough to know to get in the area, be there, be safe and, and then leave before the tide, you know, goes so low they can't get out. So it is a safe area to play because otherwise if people try to anchor on the outside and walk across and just hang out on the inside, there's a real good chance your boat could break loose and you could lose your boat. And that's another problem. So people like to stay close to where their boat is. That's just a, a normal, you know, concern of boating. Um, those are the main things, everything else that was said. I do agree with the dogs on leash and I am an individual that d does bring my dog and I would concur with that completely just for the safety of everybody there. Um, you know, I could handle things like that if that was what was needed, but please don't take the area away from us because we, we, you know, we love hanging out there and we'd like to continue to have it as our, our safe haven to go. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have eight people with their hands up still. Um, we'll go to the next person. It's Jeremy Evans. Uh, Mr. Evans, if you can go ahead and give us your first, last name, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, thank you. The name is Jeremy Evans, E, B as in Victor, A, N, S, address 7127, 48th Avenue East. And I'd like to start by thanking all of the, the commissioners for responding to an email I had sent once I know the, the notification and the ordinance had passed. I also received a, a personal phone call. So I thank you very much for listening and that response. I was definitely surprised uh, in a positive way. Um, You've already heard uh, the ideas and the suggestions, so I'm not going to reiterate. I just want to call out two things that I believe are the most important. The first is around swimmer safety and the topic of the currents. Uh, if we designate the wet northwest side of the sandbar as a swimming area, plus parts of where the beach and the lagoon are not connected as designated swimming areas, you're actually, in my opinion, authorizing swimming and encouraging swimming in very, very dangerous areas. Um, I will not allow my kids to swim there. Uh, I warn other people that are there that the current there is, is very, very dangerous. I would not put a swim buoy. Uh, so I, I would ask that a study be done as to where you put swim buoys and make sure that it's safe for everybody that's there. Secondly, uh, if any restriction is passed, I would encourage you to look at the activity in the park. Uh, and the timing of those restrictions. Um, a lot of us uh, enjoy that lagoon area throughout the winter. And I tell you, there are very, very few swimmers 
um, the, the water is colder, the conditions are not ideal, and taking a, a Memorial Day or Labor Day weekend as the as the norm would be making a, a mistake. And so I would ask that any restrictions that put in place, you guys take a look at the, the park records. Um, we, we are paying now to go out to Fort DeSoto Park, so that should be available. And in non-peak periods, I don't believe there's any uh, any concern or any danger to swimmers. I think we're trying to address uh, probably a, a handful of days out of the year where it's extremely crowded and that should be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Chris Hunter. Uh, Mr. Hunter, if you'll go ahead and uh, unmute your mic, give us your first <laughs> last name address and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hey, good afternoon. and Thanks y'all for revisiting this issue. My name is Chris Hunter, H-U-N-T-E-R and I live in Shore Acres. I uh, lived in St. Pete my whole life. A um, couple of things that I agree with, I have no problem with the uh, lagoon being no wake zone, but I would suggest we perhaps take a look at what Sarasota County did with their intercoastal, where they, <clears throat> excuse me, put a speed limit at 25 or 30 on the intercoastal, and that way everybody gets to where they need to be without a big delay, the sheriff can look at it and go, that guy's speeding in relation to the other boats. They can make fewer stops, fewer impacts with the dangerous boaters that can identify them quickly. One thing that's near and dear to my heart, the dog issue, and I have no problem putting my dog on a leash. But what I'd love to see is some anchor buoys near the uh, dog beach so that we could anchor up there, back up onto the beach, 100 yards away, walk the dog on a leash to the no leash zone and hang out there for a while. Then we could get back on the boat with the dog on the leash. We avoid all of that area, all of that hassle. And I gotta tell you something, when I get on the boat, I literally feel my blood pressure drop. It's the most fantastic thing in the world. And taking the dog and the kids out and everything else is fantastic as well. The 150, 100 yard swim zone. Oh my Lord, have y'all seen the hammerhead videos? That is not safe. And I'll tell you something else. I agree 100% with Bunce's pass. Swimming in there is so dangerous. For current, either way, whichever way it's coming in or going out, there is just way too much current to be putting a swim zone in there. Another suggestion on the COVID-19 and the 50-foot spacing. Have people on the weekends go out and place 50-foot flags so that that limited area is utilized to a higher degree because it's so difficult to judge 50 feet between a boat. But you've got people that get up early. They want to go out. They want to see the birds. They could go out and place those flags and retrieve them. Seaplanes. You could use regatta buoys like the sailing center does and designate landing and takeoff zones that are outside of those areas. You could have the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary or Eckerd College assist in retrieval and deployment of the buoys each weekend because probably during the week it's not necessary. Um, let's see what else have I got written down because I know I'm running out of time. Oh, a GPS map would be so helpful for us. Um, let me think. You got 10 seconds, sir. Access. Ah, boardwalks, aspects from the parking lot that we discussed last week. We could do some additional boardwalks to get people over those um, particular zones that are difficult access. The other thing you could do is color coded buoys. You could add kid zones with uh, lifeguards in those particular areas. Mr. Hunter, I'm sorry, your time's expired. That's all I got. All right, thank, thank you, sir. You. All right, Madam Chair, our next speaker is Todd Gonzalez. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, if you can go ahead and unmute your mic, uh, give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, it's Todd Gonzalez. That's T-O-D-D -D Gonzalez, G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-S. Thank you, sir. And my address is 919 Symphony Isles Boulevard in Palo Beach. Okay. So Hillsborough County, I'm your uh, Tampa Bay neighbor. We go to Pinellas County quite frequently. Um, I'm not going to reiterate, I think, uh, some good points that were brought up here. I do appreciate the reconsideration. I do agree with the minimum wake or no wake zones. Uh, one thing I would like to mention, though, is our family goes to Shell Key quite frequently. And as you probably know, it's a very environmentally sensitive area. And the concern about boats moving and going to different areas, I think 
a lot of them would probably frequent Shell Key. Um, so I think that when we look at it from afar, we see some some good use of, of the sandbar essentially is what it is. And I don't see a concern with, with that continuing. I think um, the suggestions put forth here today, I think are good ones and I agree with them. So I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, Madam Chair, is Jerry Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams, if you'll unmute your mic, give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes, sir. Yeah, my name's Jerry Williams, W-I-L-L-I-M-S. Uh, live at 3800 42nd Avenue South uh, on the water here in Broadwater. Uh, we've been going out to Bunsey's and DeSoto Park for probably over 10 years. Uh, uh, my wife calls it her happy place. That, uh, that uh, I've got a 100-ton Coast Guard license, so safety is a concern. Uh, it's been really interesting through the years to see the way the sandbar changes. Uh, in fact, after a storm, we'll get in the boat and run out there to see what's changed. I don't know if you remember just a few years ago with Irma, what we call the lagoon now was actually open at the end. And so there wasn't a lagoon. And it's going to continue to change with each storm and obviously with the hurricane significantly. So I think the less we do is better. Uh, that there was a presentation made at the Tampa Bay Watch talking about shoaling, and it was talking in particular about the Pasig Rail Inlet, but uh, they had also some, had some data you might want to look at uh, here with Bunsey's, the, the shoaling that's occurring. Uh, I did take the time yesterday to actually walk the sandbar, and I was surprised to see that it has connected to the mainland because when we go to boat, by boat, you can't typically see that, but when you go over to to sort of park and walk it, it has. And what it's done is really created a larger swimming area because you have a sandbar that people are able to swim on both sides of. So there's not less swimming area, there's more. And before yesterday, I would have agreed to limit uh, access to the what we call the lagoon. But honestly, that's serving a purpose of separating the boaters from the swimmers. It's, it's grown in size. So look at that as we make a decision uh, that, you know, what a boater is looking for is deep water right up next to the shore to get the boat in and then have shallow water to walk the anchor in. And, and that's what makes Buncey so attractive. People go on the inside for two reasons, is the current in the, in the uh, pass or it's full. And so they're not, they don't wanna go down where the swimmers, they wanna be right there on the pass. So another thing is be careful with swim buoys. Uh, if some swim buoys do two things, they keep the boaters out, but also they give the swimmer a false sense of security that they can go out that far. You put a swim buoy out a hundred yards, that says to the swimmer, it's okay to go out there. And uh, you know, what all this is about is really not about swimming. It's, it's walking on the beach. When we go out to Bunsies, that's the main thing that we do. And when you see people, from the North Beach at DeSoto Park, that's what they're doing is walking toward that. Yes, they're in the water, but you know, they're not swimming laps or anything like that. It's walking in the water. So I guess my recommendation at this point is not to restrict the lagoon and to look at a no wake buoy to provide a, a safer environment. So again, thank you for your time. I hope you'll consider those things as we go forward. Thank you. And I'm sure we have six remaining hands that are up. Our next speaker, I don't have a name. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute. If you can give us your first name, last name, address, and you'll have three minutes. Yes, hello. This is Raul Poe. Last name, P is in Paul, O-U. I'm at 637-79 Circle South in St. Pete. Uh, thank you very much for agreeing to re-review this. I know that once people make up their mind and they vote on something, it's not. It's human nature not to want to go back on what you thought of. So it shows a lot of professionalism and that you care at the responses that you received. We really appreciate that. The reason we moved to Pinellas County in St. Pete, I've been coming here for, for years from Orlando. We would come here to boat. When we decided to have a family, we relocated here nine years ago because of the boating community and the access to great beaches. We established our business in Pinellas County for that specific reason. I, I understand and I agree with the issue of swimmer safety. Please consider the fact that the swimmers, the overwhelming majority of people that are outback key come by boat, period. 
very few people come from Fort DeSoto because the parking lot and that North Beach parking lot is about three quarters of a mile on that beach. So it's very far and most of the swimmers are there by boat. So I do believe in everything that everybody has said ahead of me. Idle speed in the lagoon is necessary. People with, if you're not a boater, you may not understand this. I know one of the commissioners said you're a, you're a motorcyclist. There's a difference between a Harley and a Vespa or a little scooter, right? So different vehicles can go in different roads. Um, the lagoon is great for small flats boats, smaller boats. That lagoon presents an area that's safe. It's a no wake area for the most part because they're not getting destroyed by all the wake from all the other boats. It's safe if you have smaller kids. It's where we would take our kids when they were small because it's very, very safe. I ask that you don't, ex exclusion is not the solution for Outback Key. I think we have to figure out a way to continue to bring these boaters and continue to have the positive economic impact that these boaters bring. This weekend alone, I can tell you that in St. Pete Beach, four different hotel rooms were occupied by friends of mine from Orlando, and they all brought their boats down because of Outback Key. So the last thing I want to make sure that we also talk about is using the term open water is not a very informed comment, nor is it a solution. Open water is used for certain things. You don't go swimming in open water. You can't go into water in open water. Open water is just not an informed solution to what we're trying to do here. Lastly, please consider that the Tampa Bay Times is only received in 13% of all households in Pinellas County, therefore not an appropriate use of public notice. I understand in the past, we used to put them in the town square, the newspapers got to where they need to be in popularity. I'm sorry, most people don't read the newspaper. I was glad to see that this was pro uh, very uh, nicely posted on your website and we consider other ways of posting things like this. Uh, unfortunately, one page on Mother's Day is not uh, not sufficient. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope that you continue to do your due diligence and listen to opposing views, not just those that are trying to control and protect the swimmers that get there by boat. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker, I don't have a name for. It's Kay Carlin. If you can go ahead and give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Okay, this is Kevin Carlin, um, live at 4033 12th Street Northeast uh, in St. Petersburg. Um, I am the chair of the Tampa Bay Marine Industry Association. I was one of the ones that um, uh, was lucky enough to speak to Chair Gerard and Mr. Cosey uh, yesterday. And again, appreciate that time and uh, appreciate the whole uh BOCC coming back together on this and, and letting the public weigh in, um, as, as the other speakers have mentioned. Um, one, I just wanted to reiterate a few things from yesterday in that, you know, as most people are saying, the, the really the only vessels that can access the lagoon at high speeds due to the shallow water are the personal watercrafts. Uh, but also there's, you know, uh, on, a, on a crowded weekend, there's hundreds of personal watercraft out there, and there's three or four of them running at high speed. So I, I truly think it is a, a bad apple syndrome. There's a few bad apples that could be creating a really bad problem. Um, you know, there's, it's been mentioned quite a few times in the discussions uh, uh, among the commissioners that, you know, it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, I'd like to point out that I don't believe there has been any accidents there. It's been a very popular boating destination for a long time. This isn't something that's just popped up in the last year or two. And there hasn't been an accident. So what, luckily there hasn't been. And so I believe it is just a couple bad apples um, that has, has, has brought this, this issue before uh, you commissioners. Um, so, uh, and, and as everybody said, a no wake zone would, would, uh, cure that quickly. So, um, but then also I, I would like to push leaving the lagoon open to the boaters because the boaters use that lagoon one, it's, uh, really only accessible by smaller vessels. So a lot of these vessels, uh, are not safe to anchor on the outside. If the sea state is, is rough or the current is moving very quickly. So they bring the smaller boats into the lagoon, but 
uh, the, these boats that come into the lagoon want to use the lagoon for all the same reasons mentioned, um, I believe, by uh, Commissioner Peters when she was speaking about paddle boards. You know, it, it avoids the current. It gets your children, if you're family, get your children in the shallow water. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about dogs. Dogs have to have the shallow water to be able to use it. So, so the boaters, I believe, are the majority of the bathers or the swimmers in that lagoon, and they're using it for all the same reasons that the park goers would like to use the lagoon. Um, um, Mr. Carlin, I'm sorry, your, your time has expired. Okay. Well, and I just wanted to thank you for meeting with us yesterday. It was very helpful. Madam Chair, we have five remaining speakers on the line. Uh, the next speaker is coming on the telephone line. Last four digits, 2158. If you can give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes. Hi, my name is Rochelle Valdez, and I'm actually the person that started the petition for Bunces Pass. So I would like to say thank you very much to all of the chair members for your consideration. It's something that we use every weekend. And so for us, it was quite a big deal because it's the last available island where we can enjoy actually pulling the boat up, anchoring, taking the dog and hanging out with our friends. Um, so I wanted to say thank you very much, Commissioner Welsh and Commissioner Justice for responding to my emails yesterday and for taking the signatures of your constituents, 7,600 or so and counting. Um, so I, everyone has really addressed all of the issues. I think the greatest issue for me would be to, I saw this morning you, you posted on Facebook notice um, that this meeting was happening. A lot of us don't look at the paper. So for me, that was a, a very easy way to see what was happening in the county. We just recently moved to St. Pete and we love it. Um, so really those are my only issues. I think that the considerations that everyone else has suggested valid. And so I thank you for your reconsideration. I'm sorry for the loud noises. I'm <laughs> trying to jump between patients. I'm a nurse here in, in Tampa. So thank you very much for all that you've done. Thank you for your service. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Steve. I don't have a last name. So Steve, if you can give us your first last name, spelling and address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, my name is Steve Jones. Um, I live at 2803 Passage Grill Way in St. Pete Beach. Um, I appreciate the commission's reconsidering the ordinance, uh, but I would ask that the uh, commission act as narrowly as possible in whatever future role making uh, it engages in. If the objective is to protect swimmers at Fort DeSoto, it should be narrowly tailored to do so. That could be accomplished by simply prohibiting Fort DeSoto visitors from walking over to the sandbar. I mean, it also begs the question, why are people walking over from Fort DeSoto? Perhaps parking access should be controlled at Fort DeSoto so that sufficient distancing is available so that people are not encouraged to walk over to the sandbar. Um, I'm also concerned about the commission asserting what is effectively regulatory jurisdiction over sandbar that is sovereign submerged land that is within the jurisdiction of the Department of Environmental Protection per the Florida Administrative Code. Um, so alternatively, if we don't want to regulate people from walking out of Fort DeSoto, if that's the legitimate safety concern, I would echo the sentiments of others who say, you know, let's narrowly tailor this via no wake zones, prohibiting um, speed in the lagoons and the west facing beach area of Fort DeSoto. Um, I mean, we're talking about a, uh, a very dynamic sandbar that is not within Fort DeSoto or the county parks jurisdiction. And if, you know, the ostensible need for this is swimmer safety at Fort DeSoto, that should be the narrow focus. I've heard so many comments from the commissioners that are basically trying to regulate a sandbar that's an amorphous thing that, you know, has been there for better than, you know, five, 10 years with no meaningful incident or need for regulation. I think the COVID pandemic has increased the attendance at the sandbar because people need to get out of their homes 
and I understand there's legitimate concerns about distancing, but those those concerns are addressed by existing regulations that can be enforced. We don't need more regulations and um, you know whatever regulations or actions that the uh, the county focuses on should be focused on the park, not the sandbar. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have three remaining speakers. Our next speaker is Brian. I don't have a last name. So Brian, if you'll give us your first last name, spelling, address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, my name is Brian Heath. I live in St. Pete, Florida. Um, I would just first of all like to say thank you for uh, reconsidering this as well. Um, I came across the change.org petition and this news of the ordinance just hit me out of the blue. Um, I had no notice that a change like this was even being considered and I frequent that pass every weekend. Um, I would suggest in the future that, um, like another caller said, to um, make changes in the way you uh, announce things other than just the newspaper, which uh, I know hardly anyone gets anymore. Um, I, I understand that um, with everything that's going on, Zoom meetings and things like that, um, notice isn't necessarily easy to give. Um, and participation in the meetings in person obviously isn't very possible other than what we're doing right now. But um, I just, uh, as a resident, I've lived here my whole life and I've felt kind of taken advantage of that something that was this, um, it affected us all this much as locals was voted on so quickly without um, input. So I was happy to hear that you guys are going to uh, repeal it and reconsider all of your options rather than just uh, voting on it real quickly. Um, uh, we all have limited activities that we can go do now with everything being closed and to take one away from us uh, that we, a lot of us use weekly, it just really isn't fair. Um, the only issue that I'd like to really touch on regarding limitations um, uh, is the the current situation around Bunces Pass. Um, I've owned small boats and large boats and um, uh, putting a no wake zone through there um, does, does seem like it will uh, help quite a bit. Um, I do know that the current flows through Bunces Pass very quickly and sometimes there's just no way to get through there without just a little bit of a wake. So um, I would urge you guys to um, really look into studies and um, also consider making uh, the lagoon area a uh, no combustion motor zone rather than a no wake zone uh, akin to what you'll find around Whedon Island in St. Petersburg. Um, that would allow smaller watercraft in there, smaller shallow floating boats with electric trolling motors to come in and safety away from all the larger vessels and away from the current. Um, I do know that uh, it is quite a bit over a mile to walk from the parking lot at North Beach all the way down to the end of that curve. And uh, I don't know about all of you going to the beach here, but uh, not once have I ever gone to the beach, parked my car, and then walked a mile just to get to the water, um, lugging all my beach stuff. So uh, making swimming areas parts of that um, for the pedestrian swimmers that are visiting Fort DeSoto, I just think is um, doesn't make any sense. Uh, the currents that are through Bunces Pass are way too sure, strong I'm for... I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Your time has expired. Nope, not a problem. I said we do. We do have a question from our board reporter, though. Teresa, are you? Do you need something on your side? I'm sorry, I was unable to capture that gentleman's last name. Brian, would you uh, be able to give he, us your first and last name? Uh, Brian Heath, H E A T H. Okay, thank you, sir. I appreciate your comments. No problem. All right, Madam Chair, we have looks like three remaining speakers. Uh, next speaker is Sebastian. Sebastian, if you can go ahead and give us your first last name, address, spelling, and you'll have three minutes. Hello? Can you hear us? Uh, I guess my Bluetooth has disconnected. One moment. We can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Okay. You can hear me, all right. I'm on the laptop microphone. Okay. Uh, my name is Sebastian Font, and uh, resident in Tierra Verde and a local business owner of uh, Island Ferry. We do, um, we do small boat charters out to Egmont Key, Shell Key, uh, and Outback Key as well. Uh, I had written a letter. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank all, um, all the commissioners for looking at this again. It shows, uh, shows leadership and an unselfish commitment you know, to the community. So thank you for revisiting this. 
Um, my perspective is that of a sea captain and not a boat owner. And what that means is um, I'm very focused on the safety of the souls on board and safety of the lives in the water around the boat. Um, also remember our passengers are swimmers and snorkelers in that area. Um, we're out there every day, um, ever since that outback key formed, which was late in 2013 after that big storm. That's when the sandbar became large enough to, to sustain you know, boats and, and the activity. Um, it's a paradise over there. It's an absolute paradise. And um, so I think if you're gonna restrict any activity, it should be in baby steps rather than bringing uh, the sledgehammer all at once. Uh, a no wake zone makes all the sense in the world and it's low impact. And I think just about all the boaters would embrace it. Um, wave runners are another issue. And the activity there with the wave runners has increased dramatically. And all my captains have noticed this as well. Um, in the last 18 months, it's, it's increased dramatically. Uh, consider the nature of the wave runner rider. They're not renting a wave runner to go slow or to operate it at a leisurely pace. They rent it so that they can drive it fast enough to set their hair on fire. Um, and that, that definitely does not mix well with the lagoon. So an exclusion for wave runners and jet skis would make sense to me, especially given what I've seen. And, and I, you know, we, we get to see Outback Key um, on the holiday weekends and then during the week. And so, so we've seen all the different scenarios. Uh, wave runners do not have the discipline that a boat owner has. So, um, so, so I, I think it would make sense to exclude wave runners, but nothing more. Start with a no wake zone. Um, it's worked at Shell Key and some other locations. Let's start with that and, and, then, and then get some new observations and see how things look. But wave runners are definitely sir, the one high so, risk element. Am I done? I'm sorry. Yeah, your time has expired, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have two remaining speakers. Our next speaker is John Kurtzman. Uh, Mr. Kurtzman, if you'll go ahead and give us your first, last name, spelling, address, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, John Kurtzman, 5810 Bahia Honda Way South in St. Pete Beach. That's K-U-R-Z-M-A-N. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, first, I want to commend you all for putting a hold on the prior ordinance. Uh, as I hear new considerations, however, let me please ask that you take baby steps. And that was a word that I wrote down before the prior speaker. Uh, for every action, there is a reaction. And although you essentially repealed last week's ordinance, I'm sure you've seen that you can't repeal the law of unintended consequences. So um, I'm new to the area, but an experienced voter. And one of the things that attracted me to Ben Ellis County was seeing Bunces Pass, the way everyone got along and kept safety priority dogs having a place to run, people able to tent, and an all-around good feeling about what was going on in the sense of community. I made a trip there again on Saturday, and what I observed relative to your discussion is that the north end has a long, shallow area itself, and so it's not viable for anchoring. Even my PWC almost got stuck. The west side, as people mentioned, certainly, un certainly is unsafe to have people swimming in 150 yards, uh, so no change should be made there. East side, although I think I heard mention of a no-wake or minimum wake, that seems excessive as long as people observe the regular laws that are already in effect regarding speed within specified distances of another vessel or swimmer. swimmer. People are only swimming in the area of, of the boats given the tide, and people, of course, approach the area to slow speed. Wave from boats are not the issue there on the outside of the area. Waves were heavy on Saturday, for instance, simply from the wind, and you can't outlaw the wind. So no wake on the east side should not be done right away, but the main focus for all this would be to make sure that the lagoon itself is considered no wake with no other changes in the upcoming phase. I also concur that kite surfing is a great sport in this area, as well as unleashed dogs able to have a good time with the people as well. It seems that the seaplane issue is addressed by other controls, such as not being able to do certain things too close to other boats or swimming. So please just take baby steps on changes that you make as the reactions in this area or reactions in other areas as you squeeze the balloon of the boating community, the PWC community, may make things worse instead of better as the pressures move to other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are no more speakers that wish to be heard. 
Okay. Um, yes, Commissioner Peters. I just want to get confirmation. The one gentleman said about the 50 foot with the boats, but that order, I believe, expired. Barry, do you want to confirm that? That that order expired from the governor, so the 50 foot rule is no longer um, an order by the governor in place? I don't recall. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Okay, well, we can check with the sheriff, but I'm relatively certain that expired like two weeks ago. Okay. Doesn't appear the sheriff is still here. Um, no, the sheriff, want... sheriff had to get off. Yeah. Um, we can get that information. Yeah, I'll right. have staff look it up. So I'd like to take a lunch break, but before we break, I'd like to hear uh, from Paul Kazi to see if he's got any comments he'd like to make. Hello, commissioners. Um, can you hear me? Yep. No, I appreciate the uh, uh, the feedback that we heard, and of course, in our meeting yesterday, um, you know, when we went into this thing, obviously, this wasn't something that just started this year, it was based on issues that were being experienced last year uh, before we had the reduced numbers and, and everything. So uh, we'll certainly um, look at some other direction uh, at your direction and hopefully we can do something, work it out that uh, allows as many users to uh, take advantage of that resource um, while keeping everything safe as well. Well, and as we promised the people we were meeting with yesterday, Paul will be working with the or with the associations um, on these. Obviously, we've gotten a lot of suggestions uh, both today and in email, but uh, when we come back in two weeks, we'll have something a little more rounded out. I appreciate your work on this, Paul. You're welcome. All right, should we take a uh, 20 minute break? Does that work? About 29. Okay, 29 minutes. This is the 1.30. Yeah, all right. See you Thank then. You. All right.
I'm ready. All right, let's do it. Okay. <clears throat> All right, on the agenda brief, um, the item number one is countywide planning authority, it's a map amendment um, uh, for 1.46 acres, tarp, city of Tarpon Springs. Uh, this is to develop um, a, um, a redevelop a property into townhomes. Um, this is a no increase in the density recommended 12 0 uh, from Ford Pinellas and 14 0 from the Planners Advisory Committee. Okay. Do we get any uh, correspondence on any of these? Um, I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't have it up, but I'll ask staff to look while, while I'm going okay. through this. All right, thanks. Deal with Joe. Um, on the second item is uh, five, none of these are, from my understanding, controversial. Um, uh, second item, City of Largo, 5.62 acres. Um, to redevelop a, pro a vacant property into a self-storage facility. Um, again, the um, a unanimous vote, vote from both Port Pinellas and Planners Advisory Committee. Uh, item number three is um, a little under one acre, three quarters of an acre um, from the city of Clearwater, uh, public, um, semi-public to office. Um, this would, uh, for as proposed, Proposes the use of the property is consistent with category criteria, so there's not a specific use yet, but it's uh, to office. Again, unanimously recommended from both Ford Pinellas and the Planners Advisory Committee. Next item is Safety Harbor. Item number four is from Safety Harbor. This would, in essence, take a parcel, a, a home, and add it to their Folly Farms Nature Preserve. Um, and uh, incorporated in so that's from low medium uh to recreational open space both recommended uh, both committees recommended unanimously yes commissioner eggers yeah um and as soon as i say this i'm gonna i'm like i'm a little nervous to say this but from my recollection <laughs> during our mpo meeting or ppc meeting there was no i don't remember any comments on any of the four items so to your to your question a minute ago I think it would be, is, and Barry's comment, it was pretty non-controversial. Okay, thanks. Um, the way, uh, items five, six, seven, all reports or um, a report to file. Um, item number eight is a plat um, for both the Siega Millennial Estates. Um, this is a splitting three, uh, creating three lots. Um, from, so it's a, it's got the site plan. Um, the site is being subdivided into 11 single family lots. So it's taking three lots and splitting them. So questions regarding this? Well, um, and that's something that's already happened. I mean, it's already been developed. So I, did that, that I, I, I don't have that within my notes, but let me look at that. Submitting the plat as a requirement of set plan number. Um, I, let me get, let me look that up and get back to you. I'll have staff look that up. Um, item number nine is an award to CEC Motor and Utility Services. Uh, this is a six-month contract for purchase of new motors, parts. Um, total contract terms two point five million dollars. Three awards. This is the lowest competitive. I'm sorry, it's a sixty-month, not a six-month. Um, contract, so it's five hundred thousand a year for five years. Um, competitively bid. This is uh, for all of our different utility um, uh, needs. Item number ten is ranking of firms with whatever the name of that group is. This is for our done uh, all-site water reclaim pump station improvement project, seven hundred fifty-two thousand. Uh, professional engineering services. Um, and in particular, this um, it actually had 29% uh, to the S to three small business enterprise firms. Um, so successful um, breakout on that project. Going down to um, item 11 would be a local state of emergency for the following week. Item 12 would be declaring an 
chew the property uh, surplus and transfer the property to donate it to Habitat Humanity to create a new home in North Greenwood community of Clearwater. Item 13 is a purchase agreement with Depart uh, Florida Department of Transportation for a purchase of a county owned parcel in support of the US 19 road improvement projects from Northside Drive to North to County Road 95. Uh, so this uh, for $121,000. The project will rebuild uh, 19, creating a six lane controlled access with one way frontage roads. Item 14 is the seventh amendment to the purchase agreement with uh, Genuine um, Parts Company. Um, it's a Napa Auto Parts. This, we actually, this is uh, to continue what we have been doing, but uh, it's outsourcing the parts process. Um, this was part of a, a larger competitive contract, um, locally with Hillsborough and Polk counties and the city of St. Petersburg and Pinellas Park to use uh, this contract to provide parts for their different fleet operations. Uh, but they're actually located within our facility and provide all the services to support the departments uh, for the parts needs. Item 15 is ratification of, uh, of me accepting a grant on behalf of for CARES Act funding for St. Pete Airport. Uh, they received $8.7 million. There's no local match. The grant funds must be used within uh, four years. And 16 is uh, the the actual funding agreement for that, which obviously they need. <laughs> um, item 17 is a capital funding agreements with Tampa Bay Watch for the construction of the uh, Watch uh, Discovery Center and for the Florida Holocaust Museum. One's for 300,000, the other for 350,000. As we previously agreed to, uh, item number 18 is a second amendment with the Southern Group for our state governmental services. Uh, this is a two year extension uh, of the agreement for a total of $156,000. It's keeping the same amount, but extending it for a two year period. So the total four year period is $312,000. Um, item 19, funding recommendations for um, Edwin Byrne Memorial Justice Grant Program. So. This will provide $268,000 in support of seven projects. And that is recommended by the, um, that group. And item number 18 is a renewal of a behavioral health transportation plan to support and facilitate the designated receiving system. Um, this is a, a three-year renewal, um, exists, extends the plan through 2023. Yes, Commissioner Peters. So you cut out, Barry, you're on number 20, correct? Correct. Okay, so I do have a couple of questions, um, especially based on the conversation this morning. Um, it does say in there that because of March Manax that there would be some changes um, forthcoming, um, mm -hmm. and I anticipate changes forthcoming. I just wanna make sure we can do an amendment later on this. Um, and also, I know we renew this for three years, but I don't know that this is any kind of signed agreement with hospitals. For example, if if uh, hospitals refuse the refu hospital refusal section in the back of that, um, we're not. I mean, we're renewing this as ours to submit to the state, I assume, but we're not requiring anybody to sign off on this or give us um, MOUs or anything like that, are we? Let's, um, Brian, if we can get Lourdes uh, to. Yep. Um, She's on her way right now. So she can answer the questions directly. Okay, and then um, Lourdes, one more other thing while you're, while you're coming on there. On the inclusionary guidelines, Axe was not included on that at all. And so to me, this would have to be updated to include Axe um, on the exclusionary guidelines. Um, they included one more and they included PEMS, but they did not include Axe. Um, and so I, I think that's missing. If maybe we could get that done before Tuesday, I don't know, but um, those are just my thoughts, those three thoughts. Lord, okay, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, regarding the Marchment Act um, and changes forthcoming, we really struggled with this. This is a um, project of the Acute Care Committee. 
um, that has been working on this for quite a while. Um, and we struggled some, to be honest, with the you know, updates that we were waiting for the KPMG. So, um, you know, as, as far as three years, we actually debated that. Well, should, should we just do this for six months? Should we do it for three months? And we know we can come back to the board as things um, continue to be flexible and we move on um, different areas of this. So we don't expect to wait three years to come back for changes. I think that was maybe um, one of your questions, um, Commissioner. As far as, um, so that's as far as Marchment. Um, apps not being included, um, we just changed through our Nellis Integrated Care Alliance through PICA that they are going to be, this was just like two weeks ago, um, they are going to be working with Northside Hospital to take some of these folks. Um, so that does need to be updated. Um, I can't tell you that it will be updated by next Tuesday, but I agree with you on that. Um, that was just uh, two weeks ago, they uh, advised they would be doing that. Um, and then as far as the hospital renewals, there's a lot of folks that worked on this and agreed to this, um, but you're right, there isn't anything signed by the hospital. So I can take that back to the group. Okay, thanks, Lourdes. Um, you pretty much confirmed everything. You confirmed everything I was thinking of, but so since we're working on that Northside Acts thing, I think Northside is transporting, is that correct? Or is Acts yeah. coming to get those patients at Northside? They are working with, with Northside who is interested in doing this. Um, and I know your office had some work to do with that um, or connecting with that to get the patients to um, ask. We also just heard this last week that daycare is also interested in uh, using some of those beds because as you all recall, okay. that specifically for the sheriff um, folks that he was taking in and he was agreeable to releasing some of those beds. So we're saving about five of them for the sheriff and the rest we want to work with Northside and now Baycare is also asking to be a part of it. So that's good news. Oh, okay, and for the benefit of the other commissioners, the reason why we're going this route is because the, the uh, patients being marchment from the jail are typically alcohol, not um, opiates, and our, our opiate deaths are on the rise. We received an email today showing that we're having more opiate overdoses than we were last year and last year was a record year so um and so just using the jail as that central receiving facility is not capturing the opiate users and so this is a way that we can capture them but none of this is in this transportation plan nor is the exclusionary guidance in there um, and so I, you know i don't know that this is complete i don't know that this is ready um, you know, if you need this for the state deadline, that's a different conversation, but I'm just not sure this is ready. And Alores, if you disagree with me, I know we can go, we can pass this. Yeah, absolutely. Say, and then do an amendment later on nine months, if that's you think the best way to go. Yeah, I would say that it's ready for now, right? With what we have, you know, right now. I know there was, you know, changes just two weeks ago. So those aren't in here as far as acts, you're correct about that. Um, and that's, you know, again, some of the debate we had as, as a team on this. Um, we wanted to get it to the commission because there was a deadline, but there's still work to do. There could be a change, you know, next month as we work on all of this. Okay, thank you. And we did change the criteria for the marchment coming out of the jail. Um, the team worked on that to get more folks. And when we realized it's just not going to happen, we don't have enough folks coming from there. And these beds are going to waste, which, by the way, we're not paying for. Um, so Axe has really stepped up. Central Florida is also not paying for that. Um, and they were very agreeable to working with the hospital. So again, that's, you know, very good news. Madam Chair, one last comment. I really believe that partnering with these hospitals is the only way and really the best way in which we can truly intervene and stop the overdose deaths and, and really have greater success um, on people getting off their addiction and using less Narcan or having to respond so much with Narcan. So um, I'm really pleased that this partnership is moving along. It's taken a long time, but it's really, it's really good news. Thank you, Lourdes. Yep. And by the way, I agree as far as the hospital, 100%. What we learned in Erie, I, I think that's the way out of some of this. So totally agree.
Commissioner Gerardio. Oh, do we lose our board chair? Hold on. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, here she comes. Kicked myself out. <laughs> Glad to have you back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. The next item, if we're ready to go, um, on item 21 is just certificates of renewal for public convenience for non medical wheelchair transport and stretcher hand providers. Into the county attorney. Under item number 22, um, this is a proposed settlement. Again, this is one of those items that would normally be brought to you under a confidential memo. So I will plan on giving each of you a call prior to Tuesday to discuss this matter. Thank you. I currently have no plan for any reports. Okay. And Madam Chair, uh, going back, we, we did confirm there were no citizen oppositions to the items uh, that we just first discussed. Great, thank you. All right, do you have any reports? I have, uh, oh, board reports, sorry. Yeah, no, well, you are. Do you have any personally? Oh, no, um, not, nothing further. We've, we've pretty much talked through those. Um, I did confirm, Commissioner Peters, you were correct that the, the uh, unbeknownst, there was no public announcement of it, um, and it certainly did not come to us, but the 50-foot um, requirement for separation between boats was repealed uh, two weeks ago. Um, and so um, now we know. <laughs> right. I like it when I'm right. <laughs> I just like to know. <laughs> well, I'm sure all those voters appreciate knowing that too. <laughs> okay. Uh, any new business items from the commission that are going to come up? Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Uh, one, first of all, I just wanted to commend the uh, the commission, uh, Commissioner Long, for bringing that item back on the uh, Bunces path. I really appreciate it. And I really wanted to say thank you to the rest of the commission for, for, for considering this. This is not something that's done lightly. And I really appreciate the thought that went behind each of you going out and taking a look at additional, additional uh, information that made you at least consider this again. So thank you for that. Uh, the other thing I wanted is to, to ask Barry for some clarification. I'm going to go through a scenario, Barry, and just want to make sure I've gotten two calls from, from Little Leagues. Um, and so I wanted to think about youth sports. The governor's uh, uh, statement last Friday opened up uh, the, the ability for youth sports to get together and compete to, I just, I guess, opened up youth sports. So um, if, if I, we, we as a county did not take any more restrictive action on that. We're not you know, putting ourselves in the middle of that. So Correct. there's facilities all over this county that uh, many of them are uh, governed or owned by cities, and they have they have relationships with organizations. So I'm assuming that as long as the cities are not doing anything, and I, I suppose they could be more strict on their own, since I, I, I don't know, that was a question mark. Um, yeah, but assuming, assuming that they don't, and the leagues want to go ahead and start considering playing, that there's no restrictions for them to play sports? That's my question, uh, other than however the parents want to, to do their own restriction on their own kids. Well, the, you know, and the question was asked earlier and, the, and the, the answer is that, you know, you've got an order that just says that we are lifting the restriction. It goes back to what we've been um, chastised about for the last two months is trying to interpret that and then apply it to the rest of the order. Um, so you have an, a, an order over here that says 10 foot separation. Um, you have an, an order over here saying that for this particular piece, we're rescinding that piece. And so how do we apply that? Um, you know, we've, and, and so, uh, that's something that, you know, I can look at. Um, and I, I understand why you want clarifications. I'm sure they do too. Um, I would probably knowing the way the governor's office is, if he, if he lifts that, then he's probably saying that he lifts that and there's not a 10 foot separation requirement, but I don't really have any guidance for that. It's, it's a way we've tried to interpret all of these and, um, and it's, it's not that clean. So again, 
uh, for folks that are out there, these two leagues, and I'm sure there's other sports and other leagues that are looking at this, they're going to make their own decisions about whether whether to play or not or, or, or whatever. But they're trying to get some government input. So what we're saying is that the governor re- opened it up, that there might be some conflict with the existing phase one that that is subject to interpretation. I think it's reasonable to, I mean, this is, this is where it, it gets tricky and you ask five people, you might get five different answers. Um, well, you know, the sheriff and I, as we've tried to interpret these, we're, we're no different. We're trying to interpret something um, and pro- apply a logic and, you know, you can look at it different ways. I would assume that if the governor said you can begin youth sports, that he means you can begin youth sports. And so that wouldn't require the 10 foot separation. I think that's a reasonable interpretation. I haven't conferred with the sheriff on these, um, you know, and, and you're asking me about this. And so, you know, I'll give you my thoughts. Um, and and I think that's a reasonable interpretation. I think it's a little a little trickier if you say we're going to have a softball league and we're going to pack, you know, 100 people into the stands on a Saturday. OK. And so there's a different section that talks about spectator um, activities and large events. And, and so um, I think, it, you know, if. I, our youth leagues are wanting to get up and running. We talked with about this on the city calls. I think it's a reasonable thing that they can get up and running. He said you can get going. Um, and so I would say it's a reasonable interpretation that they can get going. Um, I think it's also a reasonable um, guess, which is all it would be, is that the governor is going to move to a phase two at some time in the near future. Um, that would uh, then provide more regarding larger crowds or events. Um, but you know the fact that he stated that he's rescinding the piece that uh, that limp there that bans the youth sports. I would say it's reasonable that they can then begin um, to have their play. Okay, so so maybe kind of like NASCAR, they can play to empty stands. <laughs> okay, um, I, I appreciate. I know this is extremely difficult to interpret. I. But I do think this is, you know, that, those gray areas, rubber meets the road, all those things you want to talk about where people really are itching to get back, but they're trying to do it, you know, legally. And so, right. and, um, I, and I think that that's the way we've tried to apply this. Um, you know, a, a, a reasonableness is that, you know, make sure that you don't have, you know, 150 people all congregated next to each other in the stands. If you're operating and people, are trying to separate like with church or anything else that try to do it responsibly. Um, And and that's the way we've, we've tried to um, apply it absent any specific uh, direction uh, regarding the way to interpret the order. So Barry, uh, are you going to uh, get together with the sheriff to have an official interpretation on this, (laughs) or is it just something you want to let go and let, let people no, I'd be happy to get to the, with the sheriff and and send something out, you know, in that way that you you we can we can put something in writing because I know there are people that ask for forgiveness and those that ask for permission, um, yeah. and so we've got different people um, interpreting that and applying that, um, and so we'd be happy to for me to confer with the sheriff and we put something out the, the way we interpret the order. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, Barry. That's all I had. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Long. Uh, Yes, Madam Chair. I didn't know if Barry was prepared to talk about it today, but I've been hearing rumblings about moving our commission meetings to across the street and or out on Elmerton. And I'm just curious about whether or not there's been a final determination about that. That's next item on the agenda. Okay, thank you. (laughs) Anybody else have any new bit? Bi- yes, Commissioner Welch. Not new business. I just wanted to um, <laughs> state state my concern. Um, maybe it's just, you know, it was called a gray area, but, you know, this youth sports issue, you know, on the one hand, we're telling folks, you know, social distance, follow CDC guidelines. On the other hand, I'm and I'm thinking more football than baseball. Baseball, you know, I've seen seven-on-seven practice, uh, football practice, just this week riding around, and that's not social distancing. That's contact. That's um, no, obviously, no one's wearing masks. So I'm just having a problem uh, seeing 
what the the logic on some of the gas is from the state. And I understand other things we're doing incrementally, um, like what we do with the beaches and the condos. I, I get all that incrementally. So I'm having a hard time reconciling new sports and close contact uh, in um, baseball, but more so football. Uh, so I just wanted to state that I'm I'm not comfortable with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Commissioner Justice was next. Did Did you want uh, board reports at this point, or are we new business? Uh, only? Sure. <laughs> I just kind of right. combined I, them. I wanted to share one one uh, bit of news from our Tampa Bay Estuary program. Uh, we, we coordinate and run the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund uh, in partnership with Restore America's Estuaries. Uh, and that's a fund that the county has supported over the years. And we supported with BP money back in the day. Um, but out of the latest, we do this annually, uh, the latest uh, funding stream in Pinellas County is we have funded projects in Reddington Beach for a stormwater quality improvement uh, program there. Uh, we're funding a living shoreline uh, at SPC at their, their STEM center out by Bay Pines. And we're funding uh, nearly $200,000 matching. Uh, the city of Treasure Island has a living shoreline water quality improvement uh, program going there. So I just wanted to share those uh, three good things that are happening uh, that the estuary program is directly involved with. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Commissioner Peters. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to kind of report on the Early Learning Coalition. They're meeting today at three o'clock. Um, but, you know, since the we've, we've lifted restrictions on playgrounds and the governor has now made it, kind of punted it to license board as far as how many students can be in a classroom. And so uh, the Early Learning Center is allowing the centers to determine what is appropriate for each center. Um, I know the YMCA's are looking at no more than 15 students per class. So although licensing says they can have 25 students, just so you know, not all centers will go to the capacity in which licensing will allow them to. They're gonna kind of do it incrementally so that they ensure that their families are safe and, and that they're doing the best they can to protect their, their um, children. So I just want to give an update on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Anything else for reports, new business, either? Yes, Commissioner Seal. I'll just let you all know that we're go I'm going to email you the TBARDA um, May meeting highlights and also to let you know that the um, public um, hearing process is going on right now for Envision 2030. So you may want to go on TBARDA's website and take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner Long. I think it's important to note as it relates to the T-BARTA activity that the recommendations that are in that Envision 2030, should any of you take the time to go through it, um, have not yet been vetted by the, the partners that make up T-BARTA, their county commissions or their county administrators. And so there's a big part of that that I think is getting the, the, <laughs> the head over the skis, if you will, because we're going to be asked to support Envision 2030 in concept, knowing that there's no funding really truly in the pot for to implement that, that whole plan. So that said, there's a huge effort on behalf of the advocacy groups for T-BARTA to ensure that the legislature and FDOT find a real recurring revenue source for T-BARTA and that even though we will always be required to have a local match, that it doesn't go up as exponentially as being recommended in the Envision 2030 plan. Um, and that coupled with the fact that FDOT is working really, really, really hard to try and support us to the very best of their ability, we still have to do our work at T-BARTA to ensure that we get our fair share from the state of Florida, just an FYI. And also to Barry, 
know that in their budget request for this coming year, it is not going to be any more than what we paid last year. Thank you. He did uh, call me, by the way, uh, Commissioner Long. Good, good, excellent, good to know. Thank you. And we will be advocating for that consistent funding without taking it out of anybody else's pocket. Absolutely, and that was one. In fact, at PSTA yesterday, we have a letter drafted. It needs a little bit more tweaking, uh, indicating that we are in full support of TBARTA and their efforts and that we will help all we can to help them find a, their own funding source as well, but that we do not, we do not favor taking those dollars from PSTA and from HART or from the transit agency in Pasco or Manatee. So thank you for bringing that up. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other reports right now? Not the next issue is uh, virtual BCC meetings. I mean, so in person BCC meetings. <laughs> uh, commissioners, you know, as a result of our last discussion, I was really just putting it on the radar for for discussion about you know where do we go with virtual you know meetings or um, if the governor you know rescinded the ability to even have virtual meetings. So as a result of the discussion, you directed that we look at the Magnolia Room out at the um, uh, Parks Department. Um, and we so we put we uploaded a kind of a template of a way in which we could um, make that a meeting site, allow for social distancing amongst commissioners, and still get about 35 members of the public um, into the room and and still main you know depending on what phase we're in and still main social distancing. It, we can never do that on the fifth floor. I mean it's just it's just too tight. There's no way to do that. We other have we have other um, committee meetings and commissions that meet also that are even larger than the county commission. So um, that provides the best opportunity to do that. Um, and so that's the reason we prepared that plan. If, if, a, if you approve that, we can, we'll actually physically move equipment out there, um, set it up, and that's then will be a site to where we can do that for you know, the foreseeable future. What we have heard is that it would be a, a combination, again, this is strictly speculation, but it'd be a combination that that at, at a certain point, the governor would um, still allow virtual meetings, um, but you could have, but it could be both ways. It could be, you could have an in-person meeting, but people could pipe in virtually, uh, not just for commissioners, but also the public, uh, people that don't feel comfortable coming in um, to a meeting like that. So um, I think that's something that we'd still have to work through in, from staff of how to, how to manage that and the flow, because we also have a lot of other commissions and, and these types of virtual meetings are very, very staff intensive. Um, you know, so uh, we're, we're looking at that. I really want to get your direction in terms of what you're thinking in terms of when we would come back as a um, to meet and have in person meetings. Um, we have we have I, I don't know that we have any pending press um, pressure for like a tides. Um, I haven't heard back on that, but I know that will at some point be coming um, where, you know, you have those quasi judicials that just are they work better if, if we're, you know, in one room. But um, I just put that out for your consideration and discussion today. Well, and I think that's probably true with budget discussions as well, but, hmm. you know, um, I had a question about the cooperative extension. Is that a voting place? Do we know? I, 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 believe, I, believe, it, I believe it is a polling place. So it, it would be um, in use on the day of the primary and on the day right. of the general election. I can get those dates for you or we can pull them up. Um, I understand from um, our supervisor that it's also used for some poll worker training courses. Um, you know, I don't know that those would necessarily conflict and could, is certainly something that could, that could be planned around, I believe, at least the poll worker trainings. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, my understanding is it is a polling place. So on the day of the primary election, which is late August uh, in the general, which I believe is November 3rd. And we worked out those okay. um, items in advance oh, okay. um, with right. them. So we have an alternative place for the training and um, we're well aware that they need that on the, on the voting day. Okay, just wanted to make sure because I think we're probably gonna be there for a while. So, yes, yeah, Commissioner Justice. Yeah, just the, uh, we don't have currently, we don't have commission meetings scheduled for either the primary week or the general election week. Oh, 
I don't know about other boards or things like that that might use it, but the commission doesn't have meetings that those two weeks. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, my feeling. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, that, that I'm sorry. Uh, that's where I was going. Go ahead, Chair. I'll, I'll wait until you've commented. <laughs> I usually wait till last, but sometimes it's hard. Um, if we think that the governor is going to say we can't do this much longer anyway, I think we just wait um, until he says we absolutely can't be meeting virtually anymore. Um, I'm not in a huge hurry to get in a room with a bunch of people, but I don't know how everybody else feels. Yes, Commissioner Walsh. I concur, uh, Madam Chair. And I guess when is, you know, the next big public tides like public hearing coming up, Barry? We don't know. I'm trying to I'm trying to think we have, uh, do we have any quasi judicial meetings that are pending? Um, I, I'm not aware of any. Joe, are you aware of any? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any other than the tides. Um, yeah. The tides is in the queue to be heard. I know that the um, developer there has waived the um, limited time frame that we have to bring those items forward that was imposed by state statute. Um, however, my understanding is he's eager to bring it forward at some point. Um, I think we would have to check with the folks in development review to see if there are any that do have a time limit um, associated with them because we, we do have time constraints now that were imposed by the legislature um, earlier this year. Um, and we can certainly find those out. Um, as the administrator was referring to, I think the one you know challenge that we'll see is is trying to manage the quasi-judicial hearings and just taking the tides as an example. Um, you know, even with some of the distancing that was outlined in the memo, if we could have you know I think it was 24 people in the room and 24 in overflow, that's likely not enough to accommodate the folks that would want to speak at the tides. And and quasi-judicial does present. Um, some unique challenges because folks have a little bit greater right to speak and be heard in those sorts of proceedings than just on your general legislative yeah. matters. Um, one thing I would offer just on a different um, issue is we have looked into this in our office and I, and I haven't spoken with the administrator about this, and I, but I know some other governments around the state are doing this. There is a potential for somewhat of, I would call like a quasi meeting where we could have a physical quorum of you all present, so four of you present, and probably still have three of you dial in virtually. Another option, probably not necessarily a popular option, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Commissioner Steele. Um, I, got I was going to, for <laughs> the tide or something like that, um, you know, I, I don't know whether this is possible, but when we had some very large airport hearings, Commissioner Welch, you'll remember this, we held it at high school auditorium, and that way you could accommodate probably the distancing, the separation, and so on, because the auditoriums are quite large. Or we could look at, you know, the Mahaffey or Ruth Eckerd Hall, someplace I that already has a speaker system um, that we could possibly use. So that would be one of my suggestions. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Um, yeah, well, I think what, back in March when we were talking about um, uh, doing what we were telling others to do, which was to be careful and to um, set, you know, kind of stay at home and all that stuff, we decided that it was really important to do the same. And when we got permission to do that, we did that. And likewise, now that we're uh, coming out of it um, and we're telling people um, it's okay to go back and do things, do it responsibly and carefully that we need to take that leadership role as well. And I'm not saying we need to do it for next week or any, but I would say that um, I'd rather do it for a meeting that we're not anticipating a whole lot, like say the second meeting in June, uh, where we could maybe un roll that out, that use of that other facility and and do it responsibly and do it with the distancing and all the things that we're talking about doing um, and, and show that same leadership that we tried to show when we, we, we went into the, into this. So anyway, that's my thought. I would be more than happy to try the end of the, you know, the June, I guess it's 23rd meeting um, 
as a first meeting, but that's just my thought. Thank you. And I think it might be a moot point by then, but uh, Commissioner Justice. Well, that was going to go to my question of uh, if we had any idea when the governor is going to make his decision, uh, maybe this Friday at 4.55 p.m. But um, uh, my other question was, how long does it take? Like, if we wanted to do it, how long does staff need to set up the room and with the cameras and everything? It's done. Well, the facility, like out at the room that we're suggesting, we would, we've already laid it out. So they've already looked at that. We'll have to transport the equipment and everything out there and set up. So it's just, you know, a day or two um, now. But if you, if, for instance, if you said, all right, but any any qu big quasi judicial hearings where we're gonna have a lot of public, well, then we'd have to coordinate with another facility, you know, like Commissioner Seal suggested, um, you know, and then we'd have to move the equipment and stuff to be able to have the audio and everything necessary to board records. So, um, you know, depends on what you're looking for. I, I would uh, kind of concur with Commissioner Eggers, barring the, a change by the governor, I would think that June 23rd um, is a good date to shoot for. We go, go, we go through our budget sessions uh, next week and the week of the 17th, and then that 23rd, we kind of think about as a, a trial run. But um, when, when do we anticipate the earliest that we would see the tides, give or take? Well, we've kind of, I, I would have to go back with development review. We've kind of pushed them off because of this and they were accommodating, um, you know, but so we would, we would schedule that accordingly, but we knew that we really couldn't do that until we were able to have an in-person meeting. Um, you, you, you might, might want to think about uh, the Tropicana field then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like it. All right. Uh, Commissioner Welch. Thanks. Barry, are we going to recommend and make available masks for the public and or staff? What is the approach? Not for the public, but for staff, we, we are as part of our reopening plan. Um, and so we're, we're kind of fi finalizing those right now. Um, and part of that, it does include, um, in addition to sanitizing and hand sanitizers and all that, and, and shields at public counters and et cetera and stuff, providing um, masks for the staff. Um, the, uh, the other issue is um, is signage encouraging the use of masks um, by the public and others. Would it be a problem to have a supply available for the public? If they come, they don't have a mask? If, well, if, if you're talking about for a specific public meeting or something like that, yeah, we could certainly- meeting, For our meeting at the co-op. Mm. We can, we can. Um, the, the issue is then, you know, the courts, um, when they request that we supply everybody coming into the courts, you know, it's, it's just, it's one, it's, that's the piece where if, if the request is too large and it's hard to, uh, continue that, uh, that support, um, and, and get the numbers, but if that's the direction, we certainly can uh, look into that. I think just supplying the basic mass, I'm not talking N95s, just basic face covering for folks coming to that meeting right. in that close space even just cloth ones yeah just basic math for folks who don't don't have one uh jewel yeah if, if i could add um i know masks are a big issue out there there has actually been litigation in alachua county uh where they have imposed a requirement throughout the county that you wear them everywhere um it's a it's a requirement, it's not a suggestion. And there has been litigation there. I just bring that up to say that, you know, they are a matter of controversy um, in the public. Um, the court did not enter an injunction up there. I will tell you that it was interesting. The order read um, very much like they viewed them like regulations that would require you to wear a seatbelt in your car or a helmet on a motorcycle, which of course is voluntary at this point. Um, what I would add is that we can make them available. We can encourage the public to wear them. I question whether we could make anybody wear them in a quasi-judicial setting. And that wasn't my recommendation. Okay. Okay. It was just that they're available and wanted to know what we're doing with staff as well. Okay. I mean, maybe we can work with um, uh, Kathleen's group about whether she's got a source for donated cloth masks and that sort of thing. Yeah, we do. Um, limited supply, but 
what we do, and we've been using those with all of our community partners, especially nonprofits and others where, you know, they're doing food distribution and things like that. Probably, you know, just by the ease of having a box, you know, that where it's compacted and it would probably be easier, you know, to, to do something like that. I'm just, I have to look at the supply issue, um, the sustainability of something like that. But, you know, that's certainly something we can look into. Okay, thanks. All right, anything else about that? I'm willing, I guess, to meet in person on the 23rd, if we can figure out the distancing thing. Do you have um, older members of the group, I'll take a chance. We do have, just so you know, we do have a quasi-judicial. <laughs> I just found out on that oh. date that I don't think it's controversial. You're not gonna have a ton of people in it. Um, it it's just a, a, what is it, a, a petition to vacate. Um, so we should be able to accommodate with that with the numbers that we have. It can get controversial too. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I, you know, Commissioner, um, Chair, I, I, you know, you just brought up a good point. I, I don't, you know, I'd like to just, get Jules additional thoughts on on like the, the the kind of the hybrid thing where we would have at least four commissioners at the meeting allowing two or three to to be virtual is that something that we can do now um and what do you would you anticipate that still being an option when we're told we have to go you know go back <laughs> We could certainly look into it to confirm this, but I do think it would continue to be an option um, once the virtual meeting, I guess the, the order, the executive the order of the governor that allows us to do this goes away. Generally speaking, the, the way the law, um, the way the sunshine law is viewed in case law and through attorney general opinions in Florida is that you need to have a physical quorum present. So four of you would need to be physically present. Um, in the past, you all have made as a body legislative determinations that it was appropriate for some of your members to appear remotely. For instance, I know on occasion, um, we did that for Commissioner Maroney and he was allowed to appear by telephone. I think, I think it was generally by telephone in the past, of course, I think we're a little bit more sophisticated now given our recent experiences with use of technology. But I do think that given the circumstances as they exist and will likely continue to exist um, in the world, and here locally, I do think that you all would have a sufficient basis that would comport with existing case law, existing attorney general opinions, so that you could function with a physical quorum of the county commission present, uh, which means the three of you could um, dial in by whatever virtual means we were able to make available. You know, we would have to get with Brian and his staff to, to figure out how that hybrid might work. Um, but yeah, I do think that that would be something that could be done. And I do think that other local governments in the state uh, have been doing it. Obviously, it's been um, condoned by a governor's order, um, but certainly speaks to the fact that it would be available logistically. But yeah, I do think it's something that we could do, and we could certainly confirm if you wanted us to. But I, I do think it would be allowable because, again, um, you know, we have something unique going on in the world now, and, and the reasons behind why you might want to meet virtually now are consistent with what case law has viewed as um, appropriate in the past. Thank you. Not sure I would personally take advantage of that, but cause, just because the awkwardness of it. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Do we, uh, uh, what's our time? Do we need to make a decision today on this? Or can we, we're going to have, we're going to be together uh, a lot next week that we can see if the world changes a little bit by then. No, we, uh, we're, a lot. we're ready. We're ready to go. We, we set this up because I was concerned uh, Friday at, five o'clock we would have to have a meeting in, uh, in person on Tuesday and so so we we were you know operating on the premise that we would have to act quickly on this so whenever you decide that that's the trigger date we can be ready and we would need to make certain that any public hearings um, I, I think I heard that there was a petition to vacate already planned that we would be able to uh, notice it appropriately that, well that is for Tuesday's meeting, let's say tomorrow he does say we have to go back to in-person meetings. Are we able to, is that enough time as far as all our notices and everything like that? We'd have to change our notice immediately. Yeah. It, it might not work for some of the public hearings, but I do think it would work for- Well, we don't have, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. yeah, yeah. you're right, the public hearings. 
I, I would hope they wouldn't do that given the, the time limits. But again, we wouldn't know. But we, we would potentially, if it was taken away, if we lost that ability as of tomorrow, uh, we would probably need to look at the public hearings now. I do want to say, and I would have to check on the particular cases that are set for Tuesday, um, recognizing a little bit earlier into this that there was some uncertainty as to how long um, we would be allowed to have virtual meetings. We did conform some of the notices to state that we would have them for as long basically as we were allowed to, but we did draft some notice language that directed people to um, if we lost the ability that we would try to get notice out as best as possible, we would have to go back and look at the notices that were run for these particular four that are set for Tuesday. But we did start drafting notices in that manner. Okay. And it would be really hard to post something at 4.57 on Friday afternoon. It, it would, it would, for sure. Um, okay. So do we have... Do we have any kind of consensus about trying to do it in person on the 23rd? Either a uh, hybrid or all together. Do we have uh, any negative feelings about that? Not not negative, but I don't I don't see a rush to make the decision today if we don't have to. Okay. I guess. That's yeah, you're thought. right. If we're going to be seeing each other a lot, I guess we. <laughs> all right. I would yeah. add, I I did hear while we were having the discussion um, earlier about Bunce's past pass. I do believe our deadline for advertising the public hearing, our deadline for getting coordinated with the clerk and having them get coordinated with the times to get it placed is the third. So we could have that conversation on Tuesday, but we would make a, need to make a decision then as to the 23rd for just for that particular notice that I'm aware of. Yeah, because we don't want to mess with that one. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Just real quick, real quick. Um, Jewel, can you kind of give us a memo or short note on notice and how much mm. flexibility we have? And is there any move to modernize <laughs> notice in the state of Florida? Because obviously folks aren't looking wherever we do the, the traditional notice. We can certainly get you some information on that. I will tell you that um, there have been moves made in the past to change the legal requirements for the public notices that you all post. There are generally um, certain industries out there that oppose that move. Yeah. Um, but that said, you know, even though we're legally required to continue advertising in the hard copy newspaper, we can certainly choose to advertise above and beyond that. Um, and, and I do believe that we do in a number of occasions, but yeah, I mean, we can get you what the requirements are. I mean, generally what you are required to notice just above and beyond your normal meeting notice, notice would be things like your legislative and quasi judicial hearings on like land use or zoning cases, ordinances, obviously the petitions to vacate, and they're all going to have some unique requirements as a general rule. We need to have things advertised 10 days in advance and keep in mind that also requires some lead time with the newspaper to get those ads placed and they're only printing the newspaper currently i believe on wednesdays and sundays so right. that further restricts our ability um, from a timing perspective but what we can do is put together some guidelines and i can get with the clerk and get some logistical information too as to kind of as to some of the lead time that, that they need Okay, and if there's social media options, I mean, just people aren't looking in traditional places anymore. So, right, even and a addition to okay, printed. we do put that those out through social media also. Oh, we do. Yeah. Maybe that's something we need to let people know. <laughs> and in some of your zoning uh, cases, they get posted in the yards, and people within right. a certain radius get mailed specific notice. So there are some notices that we actually have imposed upon ourselves through the zoning code. Um, just as a for instance, that do provide extra notice. But I do know, as the administrator said, that we do generally, as a general rule, really try to push that out there through our website and through social media. We can voluntarily advertise it any way we like. Okay. As long as we're still meeting the legal requirement. Commissioner Eggers? Just for, so for clarity, after all of this discussion, as it stands now, we're meeting uh, virtually on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Right. Okay. So there's no there's no meetings anywhere else planned unless we're told differently by the governor tomorrow or whatever. 
and that we're right. kind of in the back of our minds looking at June 23rd decision pending. Right. Okay. Well, we have to decide something. Yeah. On Tuesday, is that the third? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All or right. Second, I think, but yeah. Anything Thank you. else? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.